It's a new year, y'all. And for me, I've never been one to do resolutions. I do solutions. And for the past almost two years, I've been drinking AG1 every single day. Thanks to my brother, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who turned me on to this incredible product. Every day, every morning, no exceptions. Just one scoop and a glass of water. They also make packs that you can travel with. That's been very, very helpful for me as a active touring person having these packets with me all around the world has been really really helpful so if you're a musician or somebody that is always on the go the travel packs are incredible ag1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins minerals and pre and probiotics it's a very powerful it's very healthy and it's really simple man healthy aging shouldn't feel complicated the thought of taking multiple supplements and all these types of vitamins and stuff and powders it's truly exhausting for me I've never been one to take a lot of uh, multivitamins anyway throughout my whole life. I always prided myself in just eating vegetables and eating all the stuff I need naturally, not in a pill form. So this is incredible. It covers my nutrient gaps. It supports my mental and physical health. AG1 is hassle-free, 60 seconds every morning. It's the high-quality ingredients of pre and probiotics, adaptogens and antioxidants, and whole food sourced nutrients. I drink it every single day. Every batch of AG1s goes through rigorous testing processes and their ingredients are sourced for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. If there's one product I can suggest you guys is the AG1s, man. This has been a life changer for me. So go to ag1.com slash OLLC and you can get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 and K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. With AG1, I know I'm getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support, vitamins, probiotics, and nutrients for the day. And it's helped my mental and physical. So if there's one thing I can uh, recommend to you guys, it's AG1s. It's my nutritional insurance. I pride myself as almost being 54 years old, not going to the doctor all the time. Knock on wood. I've been healthy my whole life and try to strive to be a healthy person, stay young, stay full of energy, and still do the things I love that I did as a kid. That's why I still skateboard, play music, exercise. So start the year off right. AG1. AG1 AG1.com slash OLLC. Yo, yo, Liquid Death, thank you so much for hydrating all my guests, taking care of me and my family and my friends. Love your water, love your brand, love what you stand for, love you give back to the community. If you want to learn more about Liquid Death and how it started, listen to episode 115 with the co-founder, owner, and creator of Liquid Death, Mike Cesario. Just a punk rock skateboarding kid from Delaware with a dream. It's an incredible story, incredible journey. So if you go to liquiddeath.com slash Toby, you get free shipping on any items you order from liquiddeath.com. If you want to just get Liquid Death water, go to amazon.com. But for the merchandise and other cool items, exclusive items, go to liquiddeath.com slash Toby and get free shipping. Thank you so much, Liquid Death. Death to plastic, murder your thirst, stay hydrated. You know H2O saves lives. Welcome to the One Life One Chance podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morse. Today, I have my brother from another mother, Mr. Derek Green, back in my kitchen. Hi. Welcome to 2024. Thank you. Nice to have you here. It's Missed great you. To be here. It's been a couple weeks since I saw you. Yeah, we're in the new year. Woo-hoo. New year. Let's get it. You like the new rug I got? I got a new rug Love down it, the floor. Man. It feels good on your toes. Thank you. We have a new rule no shoes in my house, which I you like appreciate. I like this rule, yeah. It's, you have no shoes at your house, too, right? That's right. Okay. Take them off. It's smart. That's very smart. It's less, less, less cleaning up we have to do. I believe in I believe in taking your shoes off. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the right thing to do. Okay. Well, let's see if our guest uh, agrees with you. Okay. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Mr. Jeremy Bohm. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Touche Amore, my first ever podcast, and Secret Voice Records. Yes, that's me. You do a lot of things. I do. You did a nice deep no dive. I got a lot of okay, everything stapled and all organized I, with my I notes for him. I uh, Well, thank you. We finally made this happen. Yeah, yeah, we we've been running around each other for a while. So I know, man. here we are. You're Not, a busy man. Huh? Yeah, we're both I try busy. to be a busy man. You're busy too. Um, I don't know when we met. Probably throughout the year somewhere. I'm not even sure, man. I think. Well, Touche played with you very early on. Really? Um, it was you were doing a show at the Roxy that we. It was us riding out. Um, fuck. It was a fundraiser. Set, set your goals and H two O. It was, was that the fundraiser? Was, yes, it was. Yes, the one that went chance when the Travis and Famous Stars and Traps put on the Roxy. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we played that. And there's a cool picture. There's a cool poster that Dan Smith drew the original artwork nice. for. Dan Smith. Wow, thank you. And that's awesome. I do remember that. Okay. I think that was two, 2009 sound, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or 2008. 2009 probably, right? a long time ago, long man. Long time ago. I remember like Max was super little. Oh my God. Like when his first stage dive was there. Right. Rappaport did his first stage dive there. Rappaport did a stage dive. It was dive terrible. It was, it was like, it was like, 
no disrespect to Dickie we talked about. It was like Dickie and um, Clueless. Like that kind of weird stage dive where it's like Billy on a stage dive. Um, I remember my drummer being really excited because he had a quick like interaction with Travis Parker. Oh, yeah, that's like, cool. Yeah. He was just like, you know, he's, he's of the age where Blink was everything for him. So yeah. he was like... I just got a head nod from him. That was cool. That's awesome. <laughs> and then you guys met. We figured out before the podcast. Doing well, we just met in person yeah. for the first time right, right now. Yeah. But yeah. We're, we're on a song together. Yes. Ross Robinson? Yeah, it was a song produced by Ross. And, I, and that was funny because I was doing a little bit of a dive and I saw that the last record you recorded was with Ross. Yes. I actually just had a 30-minute phone call with him earlier today. But yeah, uh, it was a funny thing where from what I understood, it was a song that it was like you, Gary Holt, um yeah. and, and uh, Lombardo. Lombardo, right? And it was like these. It was like a for some sort of Halloween thing, yeah, yeah. right? Because he it didn't was, really explain too deeply, but he was like, "Yeah, can you do these vocal parts?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, sure, okay." So we had just finished with the record with him, and it was a couple of weeks, I think, after that. Yeah. And he just hit me up, and he was just like, "I'm working on this thing. You want to sing on it?" And I was like, "Am I allowed to sing on that? Like, <laughs> I, I'm not like I wasn't a part of the creation of this. Like, right. I I'm I feel like a bit of an outsider here, kind of a situation." And he was like, "No, man, I think it'd be cool." And I was like, "I mean, if everyone's fine with it, like, I'd be honored to be on a song with those people. Like, that'd be cool." Yeah, um, that's cool. So, so, did you get a like a seven inch? I did get a copy of the seven inch. That shit took a long time yeah, to get made. Yeah, a fan. Of, a fan of. Uh, of of my band was I was on tour and he was like hey I got you this is a present I was like oh my god I never would have had this <laughs> it was a situation where like I think because it was 2020 yeah so the pressing plants were like yeah. as, oh, yeah, yeah, as yeah, yeah. fucked right. as true. as humanly possible so I remember because I was just like I didn't want to go through like having to have Ross like track down a copy for me so i was like i'll just pre-order this and i remember it literally came i think like a year and a half later yeah. wow pretty much yeah that's like almost like max and mark roll back in the day like oh, ordering yeah, from the, the fanzine right. and have to like send you order and it takes like months but we didn't complain about it because we had no social media or internet right we just waited for it and just was so excited when it came you know what i mean those mailing lists yeah, and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. super exciting i was trying to think of the i feel so bad that the name of the thing is something ghouls right yeah so, uh fuck uh, beloved ghouls yes Oh there it is. Goodness. Who came up with that name? I don't know. Who came up with the idea of doing that? Uh, I don't know. I think Ross put it all together. Okay. It was like a mastermind by him. But was the there music? And the song's called Terrorized. Yeah, Terrorized. Yeah. Terrorized. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think I just added what would, I just added screaming that with whomever else on that. Like I had very little. Okay. Little, little, I was, she was just like, you just want to add to us. I was like, all right, man, for sure. And then this song just came out in a seven inch and that was it? Yeah. Yes. Wow. And, I want to do more. Yeah. More. It's funny. <laughs> like, rightfully so, like the headline for this, I'm like, yeah, I'm mentioned on like the third paragraph, which is like <laughs> exactly where I should be mentioned. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, oh, I guess it's, it's like, also, by the way, this guy has like, has like his he breathes on this song for a second, <laughs> which I'm happy to yeah, have done. It was cool. It was a lot of fun. I love doing interactions with other musicians. You know, they're completely different. Yeah. So that makes it interesting. You know, out of the box. Like that thing with that recording we did yeah, during the pandemic. I was just say Public that. Enemy cover song. It was so cool. It was so it, random though. You got me like, on there. And it was like such Peanut. A, a lot of different uh, people, artists, completely. Peanut from Three Eleven. Peanut MC Three Search. Out, MC Search. <laughs> oh, who else was on there? It was like um, Billy from Faith No More. That's right. It was like a crazy. Yeah. Is he going to sing on this thing? And I did Flavor Flay's part. Yeah. We did it right here in the kitchen, <laughs> too. <laughs> that was awesome, it though. Was awesome. Great. It came feedback. out really cool and people liked it. And it was yeah. just like. It was really dope. Thank you. That was some random, like, 2020 I was shit. Like, you could do it, man. Of course. Yeah. I'm not really a rapper, though, but. Yeah. I feel like there should be, like, a documentary about the boredom songs that came out of 2020 yeah. with musicians. Oh, right. You know what I'm saying? Like the amount of like, <laughs> fuck man, do you, could you just like, do you want to write a riff and then we'll collab on this thing? Like that's kind it's of, said, yeah. It's pretty cool though. Yeah. Think about it. How yeah. creative people got. Yeah, right. right. Like that would have never happened if it was a no, pandemic. Never would have happened. No. No. And like all like the live streams and this, the people doing like, cool. yeah. bands still do that too. I see MXPX is still doing that. Do you like I the live a acoustic? Other bands too. They still keep it going. Right. I think it should stay going for people who can't go to concerts all exactly. the time. Exactly. I think it's great for international fans as well. You know, yeah. You can like, you know, see what's going on with your band. You did some live streams too then during that? or We did one, yeah, because we 
decided to sacrifice a record to 2020 um uh, where which i'm happy we did i i honestly am very happy that we did it was the right decision it was when like you say sacrifice what do you mean like, meaning like here's a record that we'll, we won't be able to tour on for <laughs> two years you know what i'm saying it happened to you too yeah yeah, exactly. yeah. Same time. <laughs> I, I saw all the good in it you know where it was like we it was it was a record it came out on epitaph and it was a situation where like we of course because we're close with everybody who works there and everything like that we were Tell, being told all the records that were going to be Push. held, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we were around that time going to be in comp. Not I, competition is a shitty thing to say. We were going to be putting out a record a week before, or a, I think after every time I die. Okay, and we just knew that that would, you know, be a, a again competition is not the right word, but it's like people only have so much money, yeah. and there is. I don't think there's a ton of crossover, but there's certainly crossover for sure. So. We were like, you know what? If that means that Epitaph is going to put all of their attention on our release because now that's not coming out, that seems like a positive. And, yeah. you know, I think everybody at that time, because that was still pretty early in the pandemic. It was like October, yeah. um, I think. So it was like, you know, uh, we looked at it as everybody liked that dopamine but like burst of ordering something online during the yeah, pandemic, yeah. <laughs> All right. you know what I'm saying? Like, Ooh, something, something new, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. So, you know, I, I think it became a positive, it gave some for people to look forward to with something coming out and all that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. I'm happy we did it, but it, it was hard to, you know, we had so many friends that, and I'm sure you guys do too, where it's like who put out records in 2020 and then they were like back writing a new record in the end of 2021. And I was yeah. like, I was like, I need to experience this yeah, record exactly. before we move on and yeah, do something else. So, Trying now, to force something. Exactly. It's like, I, I feel like you, I, I've said this up, you know, on my show and all sorts of shit, but like, I feel like a record lives in four different stages. It's like, it starts with, you start writing the record. Then there's the stage of when you uh, record the record. Yeah. And then there's the stage of when it's released and people can hear it. And then you're getting that feeling of like people responding to it. Yeah. And then the fourth is when you perform it. And it's every single one of those stages is so vital to an experience of a record. And to not have all four of those and then just start trying to make new stuff, it's like you haven't learned from the last record yet. You haven't yeah. learned, you haven't grown from it yet. So, I agree, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was a crazy time. You put your, when did your record come out when the it, pandemic hit? Like February 2020. Literally yeah. Literally like at the start. Of did you get to play any shows? Because it no. shut down in like what, April? It, it shut down like immediately. We we're supposed to go on tour in March. Oh. And it just shut down like right then. There was like nothing Fuck. happening. I was going to ask you, yeah. um, since the album, people are at home and they had time to listen to it, did you notice when you did go out and play that people knew the album a lot more than other albums? Or, I you mean, know, did you notice a difference? Yeah, Good question. Yeah, yeah no. I th- I th- so the first show, so we did a live stream thing, yeah. you know, as everybody else does, you have to mm. deal with whatever you can. Um, and that was our first time performing it all together, um, like relearning the songs and all of that. But then our first real show was um, Furnace Fest. Nice. And um, that was our first and only time that we were at that festival. And I remember having like a lot of thoughts about whether I was still going to like performing you know like it was weird come back yeah. into it you yeah. go through that where you're just yeah. like do, am i still gonna like this is this gonna still, is this still what i do yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah 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 all of that and i remember thinking like i'll know within the first 30 seconds and we, and we opened i think we opened with the first song on the record which is just like a vocal thing where i just like i say a thing and then the audience yelled it back at me immediately and i got like just it just felt so, it felt so great and yeah, i remember dude. just smiling big and and thinking to myself like okay it's still there I still, <laughs> yeah. I still got this it's still okay yeah it was awesome i remember just like you you went first on tour and i was still waiting things are getting canceled i think you went out there first like how is it what's it like you're like it's weird at first and you know what i mean standoffish and like yeah it was weird at first because also because my ankle was yeah yeah, yeah yeah but it was kind of like the same thing, like I would, that uncertainty of going out and then having the first minute or so, I was like, oh my God, yeah, I miss this. You was know? it a U.S. tour? No, it wasn't even a tour. It was a few shows like in Brazil. Okay. And it was just like the feedback, like you said, of being able to play new songs that you've never <sighs> played before was nothing I've ever experienced. But that time, I think that... People had time yeah. to listen to the material, right? You know, digest live with it, it, live with it for years, absorb it, literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then just anxious because a there were shows happening again, 
And B, it was like stuff they had never seen live. Yeah, so it was like cool. a combination. Right. That made it so exciting and like, I can't live without this, you know, playing live. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard. Like a band just drops a record, then they go on tour the following week on the new record. Yeah. And kids haven't even picked it up yes. yet or they're picking it up at the show and nobody's singing along to the new songs and it's kind of adding those to your set list. I've always, that was always so stressful Everybody for me, man. Go through that. It's it's playing new songs live. I've heard like Black Sabbath do this, you know, where they're like, oh, there's a song, you know, like Sabbath, like legendary songs but <laughs> even them playing songs that people never heard and then the audience is like ah, yeah all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you it's, know it's like that was everybody yeah yeah it, it's such it's certainly psychological warfare on yourself especially as front people because yes we are the ones that know whether a song works live 100 yes. oh, yeah. percent. like ba your band members they just love playing the song because they wrote it and they <laughs> and they enjoy playing it it's fun so for them true. you know but we're like, like in the trenches. We're right up front. Like. Yeah, like we we are. We see it in the faces of people, and we see it in how they move. And and when you're first playing those new songs live, you have to remind yourself. You're like, maybe they're just enjoying it. Yeah. Maybe they like just because they're not singing along doesn't mean they're not having a good time. And that's right. something I need to remind myself yes, of constantly. Yeah. But um, but once a record from like a hardcore scene, totally. I know. Why would they dive? Why yeah. they sing along? Like <laughs> yeah, there's a mosh part there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is. I mean, that's that even turns into a different conversation. Like I was just talking to somebody the other day about, you know, when someone from a hardcore band starts a different genre, like plays that a great great example would be West, obviously doing Cold yeah. Cave after American Nightmare. I just have to wonder, and I think I did ask him about it one time, but like, I have to imagine it's a hard change to all of a sudden be playing in that sort of an atmosphere when you're so used to the high intensity to now you just have people watching and you're like, is that hard to get over? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, like we get so used to this high energy and the feeling and the feet and like, it's, it's a, it's a collaborative effort when you're performing yes, in, in right. the kind of music that we come from. But like when you all of a sudden are switching lanes and you're making the music that you really believe in, but then the, room is just still but they're enjoying it but it's hard to maybe it's hard to convince yourself that they're enjoying it yeah because you're seems, so used to the other energy yeah like my i my hat's off to anybody who who pulls it off yeah you know? i think about like minor threat to like embrace and then to fagazi or like even walter to quicksand right but quicksand you can this yeah. mosh this breakdowns yeah. in quicksand you can rock out to it but it's a different energy totally yeah. i love i love totally. but i love when bands do that I love when people do I that do too. i like how angel does to be like Justice would have a guitar and be singing these poppy songs, and then he'll put it down and play total hardcore the rest of the set. Yeah. I love that, man. Yeah. I love that we can see that now in 2023, 24. Like, you're allowed to like different types of music and actually play that on stage and still yeah. be a hardcore kid. Do you know like, what I mean? It was great, like, seeing that with, like, Bad Brains. That was another. The reggae, That's yeah. a great example. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, this is so radically. It's so cool. You know, and I love the fact that they weren't afraid to do that. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hardcore is such an. It's such a different world now and I love it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we talk about all the time and it's just the diversity and the different bands and like it's it's thriving, you know what I mean? The yeah. hardcore bands and just everybody sounds has their own style. Not everybody's original. You can't be original, but everybody has their own original kind of take on everything. Absolutely. Yeah. And different melodies. A lot more diversity in the scene too. Even more diversity. Like more, more than women, back then. Yeah, more women at shows, like which is really cool to see, you know, like up front in the pit. You know, if you think about like seven seconds, walk together, rock together, and not just boys from those songs where they were singing like forty years ago, that that wasn't really even happening at that time. They, they were trying to make it's it. True. People were still fighting it's during true. those songs, yeah, but now yeah. everything we talked about and sang about the bands we grew up on, we actually see it happening now yeah, yeah. with diversity. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's beautiful, man. Yeah. It's such a crazy like you've seen it too. Obviously, you've been in the game for a yeah, while. Yeah, it's yeah, cool, no, right? It's, it's I, yeah, I I feel like we've always been really lucky to have like kind of a mix of a lot of different people from the get go. Yeah. You know, I feel like we've always sort of been the outlier in a lot of situations, mm -hmm. um, which at times if you're, if you let your ego get the better of you, it can work against you. But then yeah. um, once you finally embrace that, it's, it's really awesome. And then you can sign up, you can find all the greatness in it. And I think um, our, our base has always grown with that too, where um, we are sort oh. of, we've always kind of had the weirdo, you know, where, yeah, where, yeah. It's, where, it's, where it's like you get, you get the kid who likes crust. We've always had a, a great mix of like 
a mix of crust kids. We've had yeah. a mix of like metal kids. We've had a mix of hardcore kids, all, all sorts. And then, and with that comes all different walks of life. You know, I love that. Yeah. Cause I was doing a little deep dive on you. You were like a, a metal metalhead kid kind of at first kind of high school and then middle school. Totally. Yeah. Like, and like Victory I, Records is kind of like your thing you found. Totally. Hardcore. Exactly. That's, that's, that's what it was where, I mean, when I first kind of, I always, I've, I cite it uh, often where it's like, I got that, Ozfest '96, yeah, okay. yeah, fucking right, VHS, right. you know, <laughs> which has Earth Crisis on it. Yeah, 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 that's right. And at that point in my life, like I was a big Sepultura guy, still am. Uh, fucking Fear Factory and Fear and, Factory wow. and, and all of that. But what that VHS had, there was the outliers, was Earth Crisis and Neurosis. Okay. And th- and watching those two sets, you're like, okay, this is different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a few bands on that that I liked at the time that are that are a bit like more gimmicky you know mm-hmm. and then you're watching that and then you watch earth crisis where you're like these guys are just in like camo pants hoodies and they're why are, why are their hands x like what the fuck does that mean yeah and then um so basketball jerseys right and i joke that like i think this might be lore that i created for myself but i like to think that the time that i bought i bought gamora season ends the same time i bought butchered at birth from Cannibal Corpse. Wow. I bought them both at the same time, right? <laughs> and I remember listening to both of them. And my life could have gone one or two ways. Yeah. And I remember thinking, you know, I think <laughs> Earth Crisis has a little more to say. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, 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 look, I like Cannibal Corpse as much as the next person. They got fucking, they got songs. They got the, the whole thing. But, <laughs> but there was more that I, that I found in Earth Crisis spoke to you as a good message yeah 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 and also you know i was 13 at the time i think and i had you not tried anything before at that moment i'd never done any drugs i'd never done anything like that and I, it was at the time of your life when all your friends are like smoking weed yeah. out, of, totally. out of apples yeah. and cans and totally. shit like that <laughs> um i never had any sort of like cool uh reasoning for not doing it i was just like a kid who was like i just don't want to upset my mom i just don't want to let her down yeah kind of a thing um so yeah, like when all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, I can just have a buzzword for why I don't do this as opposed to just saying like, I don't want to disappoint my mom. <laughs> I can now say, oh, I'm straight edge. Yeah, You know what I'm saying? And I never, I didn't, you know, me and my friend at the time, um, we both came, you know, found these bands at the same time or whatever. So we claimed it together. So we were the only two guys in this. I didn't meet another straight edge person until I was probably like 17, 18. Wow. So we were just these like fucking losers in Burbank. <laughs> Just being like, yeah, we're this thing that we don't really know much about, but we wow. are this thing, you know, whatever. Was it something that grew in your mind also, the fact that they were talking about uh, not eating meat? And no, because because unf- because unfortunately, I am a piece of shit who does eat meat. So that, <laughs> it's that, all that, good. That part, if that yeah, yeah, no yeah. judgment. No, dude. no, 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 Just no. Asking, yeah. uh, so and it was <laughs> what's what's funny too is that like, you know, this is nothing that you guys probably haven't talked about a million times on the show, or whatever. But like. You know, it's the record label game where yeah. you find. So, I was a because I was such a metalhead kid. Um, I had a big connection to Roadrunner Records, okay. who also put out hardcore bands yeah, that I did not realize were hardcore bands. Hmm. I just, to me, I was like, For it's just example. heavy and aggressive. Vision of Disorder, VOD, man. VOD. One of my, still one of my all-time favorite bands. Don't get enough props either. That's nice. Talking and about that. uh, I went my first hardcore show that I officially went to thinking it was like knowing it was different was VOD Candiria Scarhead and Buried oh, Alive. Wow. Oh, wow. At the Troubadour. Huge wow. Candiria. What year was that? 90s. Yeah. Mm, I might have been 2000. Wow. It might have been 2000. That's but crazy bill, dude. That's a crazy it's bill. a crazy bill. And I'm and Buried Alive played first. Wow. And I remember being uh, like we went up. We were That's on the, Vogel's band, by the way. Other band. It was, yeah. Oh, no way. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know that. Scott Vogel. It was funny telling him oh, eventually wow. once once he and I became friendly. I was like, you know, yeah. by the way, I was you guys were the They opened down. Yeah, Damn. so they played first to four and I remember that was the first time like seeing hardcore dancing and being like, Well, this is fucking different. And he saw a scarhead. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh yeah. Shout out to Isaac. That's incredible. It That's was, a crazy lineup. It's a crazy lineup and and uh you know, I think that the fear that you feel in those environments totally is something that I think still draws people to hardcore today. Probably. It's, 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 it's the it's the anything can happen right. of of it all. Yeah. yeah. Being in the moment. Chaos. Being in the, yeah. And like so you're watching the shit and you're like, I'm I mean, 
I was an extremely late bloomer. I, I looked like I fucking weighed 80 pounds until I was probably like 20, right? Yeah. So like, I you could, I I would be destroyed in that place. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, so on the edges, oh, like man. this is so fucking scary. So my first like accidental hardcore show though was, uh, do you know the band Far? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Uh, one of my all time favorite bands of all time. I know they tour with, with Sepulchre. I think that was maybe before. Bef- for yeah. your time so sorry Derek it's okay yeah so <laughs> um they're one of my all-time favorite bands all-time favorite bands and uh I went to see them at the Roxy right before they broke up in 98 and I was front and center again could not weigh more than fucking 90 pounds <laughs> yeah. I'm tiny and there's photos from the show that I found online before oh wow cool. you can see how small <laughs> I am I am up front front and center and just before Far takes the stage, Jonah, Jonah Matranga walks up to the mic and he says, we're going to let our friends play a couple songs. They're called Snapcase. Oh, wow. And man. Snapcase plays and it was right as Progression came out. Yeah. And I remember being like, interesting. What does that mean? <laughs> Who are these guys? And they just launched into it. And kill it, you could tell, I don't know how, but there was people in the audience who knew this was going to happen because the place went fucking haywire. Wow. Kids were jumping off the stage. It was just like really, really crazy. And I remember being very upfront and scared for my life, but also feeling that like, oh, I, this is scary and different, but yeah. I, I want more of this. I don't know how to find it, but I want more of this. Um, so then when I found the Earth Crisis record and then, you know, kind of, it was around that same time that I found the Earth Crisis record. So... Or no, it was, yeah, maybe a little before, but so I was starting to understand what Victory Records was. So like Strife, Strife, and yeah, I, I, that guy. So I got into Strife because there was a record store at the top of my street. Um, growing up, that sadly, you know, closed probably in fucking two thousand two or something. But it had a great name. It was called DB Coopers. Nice. And <laughs> they, and because it was in Burbank, which is where I'm from, which is a entertainment town, you know. There's nothing that a fucking disgruntled, uh, uh, underpaid intern is going to do more than steal fucking promos and go sell them at the record stores. True. So been there, done that. Straight up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So shout out to Rope on the Records. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So so yeah, like th- these record stores in Burbank were just like chock full of promo CDs that were ninety nine cents. You know, because mm-hmm. it was just like a bunch of like fucking punk and hardcore or whatever, or whatever else like stuff that distros had that had yeah, extras yeah. of. So I would go in there fucking three times a week go to the used 99 cent section and open up everyone read through the booklets so i found strife because i was a metal kid and chino sang on that record oh that's right so i was like chino was on this record like i love like what the wow. fuck what is this so i bought that strife record because of chino which that's is cool funny man. um shout out to chino who's been listening to, he listens every week so shout out to chino listening to this podcast right now damn nice. love you chino nice uh so yeah that's cool i knew he was on the strife record that's cool yeah yeah, he's. I think he has two two little parts on him. Made specifically one for sure. I find out Chino was secretly yeah. straight edge back in the day. I'm gonna find it. Secretly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like um, it was cool though. Was my other band, I play I play in a band that Harley's active called Hesitation Station Wounds. Wounds. Yeah, yeah. And we got to open up the the last time we played was the ten year and or sort of, probably fucking thirty twenty year anniversary of the California Takeover. Oh yeah, which strife was, or strife snapcase earth crisis. Yeah. So, uh. Before Snapcase went on stage, I like I just like went up to him and I was just like, "Hey, want to hear a funny story?" And I told him that story. They're like, "Holy fuck! I remember that night. Like that was crazy. Like you were there. Like wow! I hope this wow, whole full circle man. situation. It's so crazy. It's really man. sweet. It was that a sweet moment. Crazy. What a great band, Snapcase, man. Yeah, absolutely. Very Incredible. unique. Looking glass self. And that time cool. period was so cool. It was definitely right when I got in Sepultura. We did a tour, and it made it more comfortable that we were touring with hardcore bands. And the two bands that opened were Earth Crisis and VOD. Oh, That's shit. The tour. Sick it was tour. a sick tour. Yeah. It was a whole, wow. Like, it was incredible. And then Victory had a big impact on us because Igor and I were really into hardcore and we're right. really into Victory. And then we're like, man, we should get that band Hatebreed to open up for us. And uh, and we just heard all these like horrible <laughs> stories. Shout out to Josta, man. I love Josta. I love you, Jamie. But the shit was like, People were just like, I don't think that's a good idea. Even Victory were telling us, like, I don't think he's. So you guys never played with Hatebreed? No, we did. Okay, okay we were like, we okay. just decided yeah, like screw anyway. the label. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're in an argument with the label, along with like every other band, and you know, hating their label totally. And so it was just, <laughs> it just ended up like doing that later on with Hatebreed tour, and then going to Europe with them. It was right. a good tour. Like, it was a fantastic tour. Yeah, it was fine. It did was you? Fine. Yeah, those guys were completely respectful. 
the uh, whole time. Were you because the time because that timeline is like what year did you officially start 90, touring with them? Ninety eight. So this was like ninety nine two thousand that time. Okay. Did you ever tour? Was were you in the band when you toured with Downset, or was that before? Yes. Okay, so yes. when wow. I worked at some record store that I worked at in Burbank, uh, the bass player James uh, was my coworker. Okay. I remember James. Yeah, yeah. James Morris, yeah. yeah. And James he's, Morris. James was like very, very important in my like becoming a person. Okay, wow. Because wow. I started, so I started work. so I graduated high school and the first Saturday after I graduated, I started working at that record store. I chose okay. that instead of going to college. Wow, uh, the one you grew up going to, that's cool. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, that's awesome. Uh, so it wasn't D.B. Cooper's, it was, one called Back, okay. it was one called Backside. Okay. Um, but yeah, so James worked there and I always knew James as like, dudes in downset. So yeah. like, um, and I loved, you know, talking Do We Speak a Dead Language and all that Great stuff. Great album. Um, and that was cool. He's working there and being in, being in Downset. Yeah. Because yeah. he had that big song, Anger, right? On TV. I almost yeah. want to say that Downset, because I started working there in 2001, I think that they had kind of wrapped up at okay. that point. Yeah. Um, That's right. It was a while But they had now. played, once he and I became friends, I think they played one or two shows, just like quick oh, little reunion yeah, things yeah. or whatever. But um, he was, yeah, I mean, very, very influential and like always had a great story. Like he had stories about fucking touring with Pantera that were crazy. Wow. He had stories touring with Earth Crisis, touring with VOD, like all of these bands or whatever. Right, so, right. so yeah, I knew that he had toured with, with uh with Subter at some point. But yes. great guy. We did a tour. It was H tour down set shelter. It was pretty sick. That's amazing. Yeah, I forget what year was that? I don't know. Like ninety six or something. Probably like that. Ninety seven. Yeah, it was a crazy package. That is a crazy package. I love down set. They were yeah. incredible, man. They were great. Um, very unique. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Burbank was it? There was not, not much of a scene out there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> in the town, or- you and your friends. In the town ordinance right now, still because the eighties, because of fucking satanic panic and all that shit. It literally says in the town ordinance, no punk shows. What? Wow. So that's so that's also why there's no tattoo shops in Burbank. There's fucking twelve gun stores. Wow. wow. But there's, Interesting. But there's no fucking tattoo shops because they're still they still think that they have this. You know, it's got super a, conservative. It's got it's got old money, old white money, old. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's got a lot of that. Right. Um. So wow. it's a weird place to. It's a. It was a very weird place to that. grow up. Do you have siblings too. I do have an older brother. Was yeah. he into the same stuff you? And or? no, he's. You know, it's one of those classic situations where because we're so close in age that our friend group is a little bit incestuous, but um, we weren't friends, mm. and then we didn't become friends until we were like adults you know wow. now we're very close and i love him to death but like he played drums oh. i played guitar so like so he, he had so, music yeah, yeah yeah but he's he's he always was more interested in like video games and shit like that okay uh he had his bands i had mine and then like we both we lived around the block from our high school so like also all the dickhead kids would just because we're around the block would come over every single day <laughs> i'm a latchkey kid because i work in you right. know i was but i child of divorce both parents you know just having to work super hard to keep the lights on so yeah. like living around the block with a mom that's not getting home till six you know it's like it's just yeah. you, you have a bunch of all your asshole friends wow. over in the backyard every single day were you a wild kid you know i wasn't but i was friends with all the wild kids yeah. so like i would get in trouble by proxy yeah you yeah, know yeah. What i'm saying like yeah whatever should by association yes. exactly exactly like wow and you're a good student in school no no, certainly not. No, no, certainly not. I uh, also use that, you know, like the latch key situation as as like a. I'm I'm not doing my homework because my mom's not asking to see it, but I'm going to copy it off the kid that, that before I yeah. start to, before before <laughs> class the next day. I, I tried to be friends with as many people as, as possible so that people were down to like let me copy off their homework. Wow, um, so you're, out, you're outgoing kid. Kind of, I, I don't know. I, I just tried to get by and like not cause friction as much as possible. I think that's still kind of who I am today. You playing sports in school? Fuck no. <laughs> I'm saying I hate that <laughs> yeah. shit. Sorry, Derek. Oh my goodness. I fucking no. hated sports, I like bro. A, no, I Fuck the jocks. I, I didn't like jocks. I liked the sports, but I didn't like Yeah, I never did that. I, but I, the, the dude who sang in my high school band right. was on the football team. Yeah. So he was a rock and jock. Rock and jock. Was that so, the band Thriller? No, the, well, it was the band that that turned into. It's a band into. called Thriller, too. Yeah, that, that was the band that that turned into. Okay. So, so the high school band like went on way longer than it should have and then turned into that one, one of those classic <laughs> situations. Um, but, uh, yeah, what was I going to say? Um, Where did Thriller come from? Was it from Michael Jackson? I th- I mean, I think it was just like kind of a, like, that's kind of cool. Like, it's kind of a fun 
name. I don't really yeah. remember. It's like oh name. I never even thought about that. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, before that, it was called Stricken, which is such a bad Stricken band name. That's like very, very high school We're band stricken. name. Stricken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the one of the um, Hamburger Safari was one of the names of the thriller. Hamburger yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting yeah, name. Very interesting. Yeah, name. It, this is the classic <laughs> example of when you and your friends make bad decisions, thinking that no one else would ever hear it, and I never have to talk about it. Fucking twenty years later on a podcast. <laughs> There's no, there's nothing out there online. Yeah, I think the bass player put up oh, one of the that? EPs <laughs> on Spotify. Uh, but it's funny because it's one of those classic situations when you search it. It's like that artist has like it's like our EP and then like whoever else's other music is on there too. So it's yeah. like it's buried in there somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm not like embarrassed of it. I play guitar in that band. Yeah, and, and like what's available, we were sort of like a mix of, um. It was, it was like kind of like it was kind of like the Bronxy sort of like every time I die you rocking riffs with like a mix of like trying to also do shit like the faint like oh, it wow. was like a mix of like wow. whatever uh, yeah it, on paper it made sense to us and right. you know in, <laughs> two, in 2003 or whatever but 2003 wow yeah. Burger Safari Hamburger Safari, it's cool. Hamburger Safari. Hamburger Safari. I couldn't even tell you where that came from. I don't. I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's. What were you influenced? Like, like you self taught guitar. Like that was the first instrument you learned how to play. Or no? Yeah, yeah. I played guitar. Um, I started in like junior high, and I took like two lessons. The third lesson, the guy was like, "No, I'm going to show you how to read music or whatever." And I was like, "Yo, my boy just taught me a power chord, so <laughs> I'm out." <laughs> <laughs> um, and I never got any better than that, you know, wow. it's, like, it's like, once you learn the power chord and then, oh my God. And then when you're like, wait, I can tune this one down just a little bit. And now I just lay my fingers across and do a bar chord. <laughs> you kidding me right now? It just got easier. I was like, all the new metal like, shit I'm that I sad. like is <laughs> just like fucking open one, open one. You know, <laughs> you play guitar too, right, Derek? Yeah. I wish I learned. That's one thing I think I should. Learn. I wish I learned. <laughs> but I'm pretty much at that same level. You know? Yeah. I was like, oh, we can do a power chord here. Great. Done. Perfect. Done. Do you play guitar in bands right now? No, absolutely. What was the last not. band that you played guitar in? Simple do it. When I first joined, I, I I felt obligated that I had to play. Oh, guitar. true, true. And then uh, our guitarist Andreas, who's a real guitarist, right? He's like, hey, he's like, you know, if you're gonna do it, you should do it a hundred percent. Right. Know, like. If you can learn this Bonded by Blood album, Exodus, and play these songs, then you're ready. And he's like, if you're going to commit to it, then it's, you know you should do it. But if you're kind of like, oh, I'll do it halfway, then it's no point in doing it. You should just focus on one or the other or both 100%. And I was like, I'm going to focus on vocals because I'm a vocalist. Yeah. And that's what I do. And so I put all the energy there. And, and he's a fantastic guitarist. And I he's think, sick. I think he feels good having that freedom to, he's always been the lead guitarist in the band. Totally. So it's like, did you <laughs> did you tour ever playing guitar? Yeah, I would play like three or four songs. It wasn't like a whole set. Wow. I, mean, I hadn't thought about this, but I think how early with you being in the band was ta- was Tattoo the Earth? Yeah, very early. Because I saw that tour. Yeah, I saw you there. Right. That yeah. would have been probably like ninety nine. Ninety nine. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a crazy like mud vein. Slayer, hella of the era, and then <laughs> Slipknot were headlining. I was like, "Who's this Slipknot? And why are they headlining and they, and over they, Slayer?" And they probably killed it. Oh, it was a whole gen- new generation, like you see Turnstile now, with a yeah. whole different generation. It was like that then, like every young kid dressed up like them. I was like, "What is going on?" Man, just losing that band. I don't know if people talk about because people they have <laughs> such a a big uh, everything. I don't know if people t- ever talk about how quickly. That shit happened because I saw them first. The first band on the side stage at Ozfest. Mm-hmm. They were the very wow. first band. They opened the small stage the first year, mm-hmm. and then in that same year, I because I keep t- I have but I'm a quarter. I collect ticket stuff. I have every nice. ticket stuff nice. I've ever ever. Me too. Wow. Amazing. Sure. And the photo albums. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. same. I want to go through yours. Okay. <laughs> um, but like you see, in on like one page in like the span of a year and a half, I have like seeing them at Ozfest and then. Seeing them at the Key Club, whoa! Seeing them at the Glass House, then seeing them at the Palladium, like all within 
like nine months probably. That's we, the same thing I do with Seaweed Turnstile coming here. Right. Oh. One venue, then two venues, and palladiums, yeah. and then Boom. the shrine, and then yeah. the f- all that. Same thing. Incredible. Wow. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Like, the, yeah. I don't, I don't know that people, like, people, there's so many things to talk about with that band, but like, yeah. how fucking quickly that I, happened. I think it was like a combination of so many things falling in place that really made it explode and, you know, like, undeniable. The same with Turnstile. You know, it's like perfect timing, great music. Great, great record, energy, great record, great live know, performers, great producers, great everything. You know, like yeah. the alignment of many different things. That yeah. Made it. Also, this is a weird one. First band whose website was flat was like Flash. Remember that shit? Yeah. Like, like it was, right. it was, it was the first. That I remember that was the first time that I ever yeah. went on a website where they had like some crazy visuals that were like the website was moving because it was like 1998. Like internet wow. still sucked. So it, like... It really... I mean, if you had a computer. Yeah. I mean... T- straight up. You know? And it was like, yeah, it had like, it had like a song that played and like the background movie. It was like really it. creepy okay. to be on and I was like, this is different. So like also I feel like they were ahead in that, in that game Smart, too. man. That is really smart. Whenever that band got together, that. like that's just like... I mean, it was also great because they added the the element of mystery because they weren't showing their face. I thought that was so cool. They never showed their face. So cool. I was like, okay, I can see why so many people are like very interested. Don't get recognized in public. Right. right. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Very cool. How many riffs did you write for Sepatora that got denied? (laughs) (laughs) Hold on. That's a a great question because we'll still (laughs) joke about that today. Like, I remember coming in, like, I would never do this. (laughs) <laughs> no, but it's like I got some riff, guys. I got some stuff. I got my four track, and I'm ready. Here we go. And Andreas and them just being like very patient, like okay, you know, <laughs> let's, let's, let's <laughs> you know. And it was just like joke after joke. Yeah, nothing past him, man. Nothing. And it was just like one riff, like maybe two albums later. Like you remember that riff? And I was like, yeah. Oh, they yeah. used it. We're gonna use it. Wow, you know, congratulations. It just a very small part. But, uh, it's a good yeah, feeling. It, it's a great <laughs> feeling. But yeah. I asked, we asked that same question to uh, your friend from Foo Fighters. Oh, yeah. Shiflet. Yes. And I was just like, did you come in? Like, Dave, yo, Dave, check this out. Like, right. I got a rip for you. Wow. Because yeah. he came like, from Strung, no. he came he from strung like, Out now, I think. Where did he come like, from, Strung Out? Where did he come from? I forgot he came from. Oh, he came from, uh, I can't remember. I thought it was Strung Out. Could have been. Yeah. Vandal? No, 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 not no. Is it strong out? Not less than Jake, not the strong out. No. If only but, there was a device. Well, he, he, <laughs> he definitely came in. And I was just like, he was like, no, I, I, I did not do that. I was like, yeah, you're smart. Like, because I just thought it was funny. I, I think it was. I mean, writing thing. songs in a hardcore band is different. Then you get to like yeah, yeah. Foo Fighters, or then you're right. in Sepultura, and right. there's like original members. and No use for a name. No use no for a use name. For a name. Yeah. 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 And That's me right. first in the Gimme Gimmies. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So it's it's a funny thing, but no, I wasn't a guitarist. I was I was like something I did out of necessity to stay relevant before even Supple Tours, like trying to put a band together, yeah. and having people, you know. After now, it could actually happen though. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um, <laughs> so f- one of your first big shows was a Bowie. You said Nine Inch Nails. Was that some? The first, they, yeah. they played together. Yeah, yeah, wow. they were on tour together. Yeah, that was a big. Wow, that was a big one. <laughs> That's a. Oh yeah. <laughs> Huge Bowie fan. Huge Bowie fan. Bowie's sick. I, I, um, I, I say that uh, I wish that of all the shows, I wish I could relive that one. Wow. Not just because it was the first one, but also because you think I gave a shit about David Bowie in 1990? I did not oh, give a nah. shit. I did not appreciate what the fuck I was seeing. I was, right. like, I yeah. was, I was a fucking goth kid who was like, yeah. I want to. That was uh, the pinnacle of that, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, Were you a big I, Nine Inch Nails fan, though? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was... Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Let's I did not that's appreciate crazy it. package because they know. did they did a record they did, where they did uh, songs together and shit like that. It I was think for like a soundtrack for a movie. They did. Something. It was around the time of like the Lost Highway soundtrack and all that sort of yeah. stuff. But I Lost think, Highway. but I think that, so. There was <laughs> Trent produced a song. I'm afraid of Americans, which yeah. was yeah, the yeah, David yeah. Bowie yeah. song. I'm afraid of Americans. I'm afraid of the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> song goes. <laughs> um, Lost Highway. You said Lost Highway. Oh my god, that's one of my wife's favorite movies, and it's one of the most boringest movies in the planet <laughs> and if me and max are driving her crazy right as of last week still she'll put it on and make us watch she's like you guys want to talk your shit she puts it right on and we like oh my god oh, she man. loves Patricia Charquette. she loves that movie yeah. but I, I, I realized those guys are part of it that's crazy yeah mm-hmm. yeah the soundtrack is pretty cool yeah it's got some good stuff Love on soundtrack. It. it was around the, it was around the time of like you're a big soundtrack fan i am a big soundtrack guy. As a, as she has a big movie guy too yeah, yeah it's a word just fucking yeah, dream right. dream uh <laughs> but yeah like uh 
the Smashing Pumpkins song on that Ooh. soundtrack is really good because that was around the time when they they started doing like the Adore record. So it was oh, like yeah. it was like you know fucking mm-hmm. Billy Corgan going full goth on that. I saw I saw him for the first time a couple months ago. I was crying. It was incredible. Wow. Smashing Pumpkins. You Where's know it? how many songs it was like in Orange County. You know how many songs you know by them. I don't even own their records, but it's throughout my life hearing these songs and like. It was they're great. Inc- live, it was incredible, though. dude. They're, I went to. They're great live. You love them? Yeah, I do. I went to. I had never seen them before either. I went to the, when they the first run back where it was like like mostly the original lineup that was yeah, like yeah. forum or whatever. It was great. I saw it was that great. lineup. Yeah. Yeah. So um, many good songs, man. Do you think Billy Corgan likes himself? <laughs> wow. <laughs> What makes I was str- I, I, I was a really great question. I was struck by that, where it was like all of the visuals and stuff like on on the stage. At least the show that I saw was like all just of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, I, okay. I, I, I was just like, <laughs> I was like, you did this for like a tour that's like the the reunion of everybody. Yeah, like right. you would think that you'd maybe want to focus a little on like the collaborative effort of this. But so, so who's in the reunion? Who's playing? It was everybody at that point. It was everybody but Darcy. But Darcy right. Yeah, she was the one holdout. Yeah, yeah she wasn't uh-huh. there when I was there, but. Th- these big silhouettes of him were coming across. You're right, and he looks like a vampire. Like it's just, he was so big, and just like the, the way he was dressed in the trench coat. He looks like a scary like creature. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. My, yeah. my his voice, dude. My favorite part of the, not my favorite. This is a joke, but like one part that I that I very much noticed was there was a song that James Zeha sang, mm-hmm. and that was a song where Billy Corgan was not on stage. He was doing a costume change. So like the one time he could have been backing up his boy, he was like, "Nah, I gotta go change my outfit." He did like, do costume changes. Yeah, he did. I was like, "Come on, that guy rips still. That guy looks great. He was killing." Yeah, that was like, nice. "Wow." Yeah, they nice. sounded they sounded fucking amazing. Hearing those songs, I mean, there's like a few songs that I was like, "Man, if they play that, you know, you're looking at the right, set list. Right. You're looking at the set list. FM, and you're like, man, it's it's been on a couple of these. If they, the song Muzzle, it's I'm from sure it's, it's from a uh, uh, Melancholy. Oh, Melancholy. Okay, it is. It's the drums in it are fucking. It's 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 my favorite song from them. So and then they they played it just before the encore, and I was just like fucking levitating. Yeah, yeah. It, it was really. I'm really happy I went. It was it was great. That's awesome. It was outdoors. Um, let's get back to this guy's life. Um, <laughs> so did you graduate from high school? I did. Yeah, I did that. And what were your goals at that point in your life? Just I just want record store, record store, and fucking listen to music and like play music with my friends. I yeah. Like, you know, then moved out and lived with. A, a buddy of ours. How old were you moved out? Probably, probably like nineteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was a situ. I never would have been able to if it wasn't for the situation where it okay. was like I had a, uh, a a dude who ended, who I was in a band with who I also got a job at the record store. We were like attached to the hit best friends. Uh, his grandfather owned a house in Los Feliz. Oh wow! This this is very of the era, right? <laughs> owned a house that was should have been just torn down i mean it it was abandoned it was like a murder scene like it was so it was so fucked up right and his grandfather basically said look if you can make that livable you guys can live there (laughs) and if you tell a bunch of 19 year olds can you make this house livable anything you're like of course so of course you know fuck we we went in there with some with some fucking uh with with some cleaning spray and a couple sponges (laughs) and made it uh, quote unquote livable, you know. It's a th- three bedroom house. Wow, literally dude. right. Like, a, uh, if you're familiar enough with the area, yeah, how was Los Feliz back then? I mean, it's way different. So now. we were right, uh, right off Vermont. Okay, and it was off of a uh, so uh, Franklin and Vermont, yep. one street up, New Hampshire. We were right there. I mean, wow. literally, once we were told we had to no longer we we lived there. We had a good run. We were there about two and a half years. Oh, wow. uh, good run. Right the house there. got completely just fucking torn down. Yeah, neighbors. Was- hated us <laughs> like like we were told on the reg that we were like bringing the value down of the neighborhood Do you guys I have parties and stuff what is like we're a bunch of edge kids but like yeah. we would have you know we it's would have party, our yeah. version of a party which is like hey a bunch of dickheads want to come over and like eat pizza and watch movies till three in the morning you know right, right. uh we like the backyard was just like dirt so my buddy built a built like a small mini ramp Ooh, uh nice. everybody would just wild. like fucking park on the front lawn like it was fucked up wow. it was really it was bad neighbors hated us for a reason um wow but it was the best man i mean we all all we had to pay every month was utilities which is nothing that was man. Yeah, yeah so you got three dudes fucking having to split like 300 bucks or 200 bucks or whatever <sighs> It was, a good time. Run, man. Yeah, it was the time. It was the time. It was the time. You know, and and uh, you know. Are you playing music at that time? Yeah, yeah. We were, we were on this band together, so 
I was just working at a record store, making no money. Um, I was the buyer for like punk and hardcore. So like I was dealing with like Rev and yeah, and Victory, L- Lumberjack, Lumberjack, all of all of that shit. Uh, Drive through was that back then? They probably would have been through. A a, they they would have had an actual distro at that point. But I, I wasn't man. dealing direct with anybody. It was mas- it was mainly just like whoever the distros were. Um, but uh, it was great because a lot of those friendships that I made then through like Lumberjack and yeah and Rev like those are people I still know today awesome, you know man. Yeah. which is cool yeah um but they start working like you started working like LA Weekly and stuff like that and like no, so I, music I, entertainment stuff no so I I uh there was a few magazines and things like that that I tried my hand at like writing for so okay. I did I did uh I did like some show reviews for LA Weekly okay. and stuff and then I did uh there was a magazine called Status okay that was also a label um out of Thousand Oaks they put out some cool stuff. They put out like um, the Casket Lottery and uh, Sharks Keep Moving, which is the band that turned into like Minus the Bear. Like a lot of like cool, like kind of emo East type yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he had a magazine, so I did some stuff in there. And the first, and I uh, through that I interviewed Jake Bannon, which I was Verge. fucking terrified. Like okay. te- my first time ever doing an interview, and it's yeah. like with this guy that I'm. Converge is my favorite band. Okay. I'm just like. Then you get an imprint on Deathwish later, uh, uh, right? Wow. Uh, I, we have, we we get to yeah, like we get to put our records on Deathwish, like the whole thing. So it was like whatever. But Jake claims he still remembers doing that interview with me because they played at the um the Troubadour, and I just sat on the curb with him outside, and he let me talk at him for. That's so hardcore, like outside with the singer, the, the sidewalk, dude. <laughs> yeah, so dude, we just yeah, we That's just cool. S- sat on a curb and 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 talked, and um, I still have a copy of that magazine um that's cool and yeah anyway it's, it was yeah so I, I i did that for a while which was a lot of fun just doing like you know because my friends and i were always doing like our top tens of the year and writing about records and stuff so it's like if someone wants to pay me you know let's be honest probably 40 dollars to like <laughs> do something you know like sure it's fine um and, you, and revolt was like one of your last real jobs kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> what, what's revolt revolt yeah. was revolt magazine or tv because it's, it's TV. no 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 revolt revolt is, was a tape film and media distribution company that was yeah. my that was my last adult job my last straight job what was your position it's still, it's I, still, I, still I around was, though is it oh no? there's no way no no there, there is there is a revolt though that's something that pdd owns or something it's like okay. connected to hip-hop and oh this is not that this, okay, this, okay, this, okay. This, so, so okay. okay so that's i went I, from, I went from working at a record shop to working in post-production because i'm a fucking citizen of burbank california and my family's all been in that my family's still in that today in so the movie like biz? yeah oh, like wow. just post-production shit that's you know cool. nothing okay. glamorous yeah, you know yeah, what yeah i'm saying so um definitely like the most you know, hardworking people in that business are the people that are just having to work 20 hours a day to yeah. make sure a show gets, you know, colored correctly or the captions yeah, yeah. get put on a show. So I, the place that I worked at was called visual data, which is as boring as it sounds. Um, and so I worked there for a while. And then um, one day we were like, had to order tapes and you know, whatever, just access like shit that the company needed that we would have to order this like punk rock, couple like punk rock kids came in to drop off the order and i was like what's up with your company like what the fuck is this kind of a thing and um so they got me a job there doing sales oh wow okay oh. the worst job of my life <laughs> the the worst job of my life and it was a terrible it was a learning experience um i learned i'm not good at sales <laughs> uh also just Were you making phone calls doing stuff like that cold calling places oh, yeah. and showing, almost, almost like telemarketing kind of showing up at post houses being like I was in the neighborhood and I was wondering if I could talk to the person who's in charge of buying your product. Oh, it just, man. It, it's brutal. Yeah, it was, it was awful. Uh, again, character building. Yeah. Being told no, uh, by people that you're hoping to make a, uh, some sort of a commission off of yeah. over and over and over and over and over. It was a bad job and, the, and not a, not a, not a good situation all in all. But I was lucky though, because I was able to, once I got fired, uh, get unemployment which mm-hmm. then let me tour yeah right. well right. that was happening so uh that That's was good. that was right right when touche started basically yeah wow so that would been like 2007 around 2007 it was yeah so so i left i left the band thriller in like 2007 and we had the first touche practice like the end of that year um i like you know once something gets like put in print or like said 
somewhere and then it can be cited for Wikipedia. You know, it just becomes life yeah. where you're like people like on paper. Yes, I guess the band started in 2007, but I'm curious how you guys feel about this. I don't think a band is a band until you've played a show. Right. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. So I we agree. didn't play our first show until February 2008. Okay. That was our first show. So that's why I'm like, now we're a band. Yeah. Same. And, and I took... We had a demo first. We had no shows. And then we played, yeah, first show. And that's smart because I also, like, when, you know, it's been a long time since anyone wanted to ask me any advice on, like, starting a band, you know. But I used to always tell people, like, fucking record. Have your shit ready to go before you play a show. Yeah. So that yeah. when you play you have something to show for it. Like you could get people immediately like, here's this here, whatever. So, um, yeah, I I took everything that I learned from all the bands I'd done it in the past and was just like, I want to start out as strong as possible. We're like the first show we had a fucking t-shirt. We had, uh, we had a, 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 a D we are like, silk screen fucking in a dvd box like a full like super diy hand numbered like super screamo as hell like that's cool kind of, man. kind of a demo situation so we started off like with like a vision pretty quickly you just said screamo would that be the genre people said touche mori was screamo kind of or post hardcore yeah like you different know categories yeah, yeah you those know, are interesting uh, to me right mm-hmm. i mean the word screamo got taken down the wrong path you know, oh, in yeah. the early two thousands, you know, yeah. like you, if you if you said screamo to your average person, they're gonna probably you know say like fucking My Chemical Romance or something like that, which is like or emo, yeah, 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 yeah. So, or or, yeah, right or the, spring or the used, they'll they'll say some band like that, like a singy screamy good cop bad cop sort of vocal yeah, yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but you know, I think to the the real ones, they think of like the fucking the bands that you know put out a seven inch and then broke up you know yeah. like the, the, the hyper aggressive right. played ba- only really played basements um <laughs> a lot of these bands are excitingly playing shows right now because there's a big wave of it like mm-hmm. the band Sasha, i put out their discography on my label and like they just played some shows which was the most insane cool shit in the entire world and how, how long have been since they played the show <sighs> 22 oh, wow. years or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. I think they broke up in 2000. That's crazy. I'm totally confused on the, the terminology. Well, I mean, we got like, D, we got DCs, we got Rights of Spring Embrace, you know, Beef Eater and stuff like that, that in our called. generation. But that was like the summer of love in DC. It was different. It wasn't really saying everything has emotion. Madball has emotion. Right. Um, people that scream in bands, they, they're they not called scream ball. That's category shit. And the post-hardcore like all that stuff to me, I was just like, it's music. What about like? It's all stemmed from the same place. I don't know. What so about like like bands like uh, Diecast? Diecast. Die- wow. I would, they're like kind of more metallic hardcore. More meta- kind of, yeah, metallic hardcore. So yeah. they're not screaming. Metallic hardcore. No, 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 no. Metallic hardcore. No. That's bands. a new one. Let okay. me make you. Let me make you a playlist. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm confused with like what would be. I can't think of no. anything fucking cooler in the entire world than me getting to make the singer Sepultura <laughs> a, a screamo playlist. I don't think there's anything. So Suicide Silence wouldn't be screamo. No, no, okay. no, no. That's that'd be like yeah, like death Corey. Type Who came stuff. up with the, the genre? It's I, interesting. I'm, I'm really, so, okay, so yeah, yeah. So, break it down like, for us. There's a lot so, of screaming going on. So like and a lot of bands. Here, here's I mean, here's yeah. kind of a way to kind of maybe break <laughs> it down. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> There's emo, right? So like, and oh, let's let's sweet. let's 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 oh, take okay. it from let's take it from like the rights of spring sort of energy, right? Okay. Like embrace that sort of that, okay. that sort of stuff, right? Do you like right. embracing rights of spring? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Um, and then, then uh, you're familiar with like power violence, like like fucking like super yeah. hyper aggressive, yes. like blasty sort of crusty punk like or whatever kind of beats. For sure, Zulu. sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, there was a term even for a minute called emo violence. <laughs> So you get a mix of that, right? So, like so, that. so it's emo violence is hard. Emo violence. Wow. So, so emo violence. Like when you think about that, right? So it's okay. like it's like j- it's jangly guitars. Right. It's loud yelling. It's it's attitude singing. It's very emotive. I see. And very hyper abrasive. So mix singing that with, on purpose with like okay. it, w- just purpose, like right? just yelling. Yeah. yeah. Just okay. yelling over each other, and then so jangly ass guitars, and then all of a sudden you just implement blast beats and shit. I see. So it's it's hyper aggressive, very melodic, mm-hmm. and um, it's not the hardest music in the world to make, but mm-hmm. it's it's pretty goddamn good. Wow. wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. So and Rebellion. and currently right now there's an entire wave of like a whole new generation's of band and that's the that's the shit that influenced Touche when we started. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
So that's what we were trying to do. But I think that there's elements of like the hardcore kids in us that also shine through where it's like we started being like we want to be like a page 99, like an orchid, like those are like screamo bands. But then also we're influenced by AN, Hope Conspiracy. Yeah. We like stuff like that, too. Who's so, the biggest screamo band you would think? Like who like so like, like hmm. the main define you know the band that defines Ooh. the terminology so screamo. the big three okay yes are Seisha who, okay. I, who I mentioned before never who, heard of her right yeah there's Seisha there's Orchid <laughs> who just announced reunion shows that all sold out in a second they're wow. playing like the fucking they're doing like three nights in New York wow um, like all in like fifteen hundred cap rooms um it's crazy okay so there's Seisha Orchid and a band called Page Ninety Nine, who I've also cited. Okay. Yeah, and they're from Virginia, um, and they've they've on and off been playing shows. Are these bands like the originators of it, or like the they're, probably for that time for that for the for okay. like the for, that for like the late nineties, okay. early two yeah. thousands. Oh, late nineties. Our shit's eighties. Wow. Our shit. We're talking about yeah. right to spring. That's beefy. All that's different. Yeah. 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 Got it. There, there, all the yeah, there's like a through line. You know, you could follow the the right to spring to Fugazi to um, to. Uh, a lot of the stuff that there's a label called Numero. How about has, Texas or Reason? What would they be? I would call them an emo band. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I th- that record to this day, all, all my love to Norman. I love, I love that record. Bastard. I love that band. Uh, that record sounds like it could have been recorded yesterday. Mm-hmm. It still sounds so fucking good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and it doesn't sound dated in any. I think of all the records of that genre, um, from the '90s specifically, that one still sounds like it could have come out fucking next week that's cool yeah it's cool he brought back anti-matter zine too oh that's totally. really cool he brought that back yeah 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 one thing i was just thinking about too is like siv's vocals on hold your ground mm-hmm. seven inch mm-hmm. the way his voice cracks yes like the, the like the you can feel it yeah you can feel this like the Absolutely. the passion the sincerity of what he's you know what i'm saying he's right like, I forgot what song it is, but his voice cracking on the seven. Oh yeah, and a few. That's very emotional parts. to me. Like that, like listening to that, you know what i mean a voice crack on a record well, or a song will make a song for me. Yeah. Because, you know what I'm talking about? Like yes. early GB stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it, that that's the stuff. I mean, also fucking just bringing it back to Ross Robinson. Mm. That man thrives on that shit. Oh, yeah, he does. He, he like, did some big <laughs> records in that, that genre? Did well, he, he did my camera now. No, no. no, no. no. He, but he did Glassjaw. He oh, did, Glassjaw. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Glassjaw. He did At The Drive-In. Another yeah. one. Yep. Wow. Um, yeah. He's really a big fan of the moment of bringing out whatever that emotion is in that moment, you know, and going with it. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect, and that's what makes it so perfect. Yeah, you know that in a weird way. He and I had like a. I mean, corn was corn. So after the biscuit, after the cure, he's done. I was like the biggest, like just I lived and breathed Nirvana as a kid. Like nice. that was my favorite in the entire world. Uh, Curb passed like just before my birthday when I was like. Yeah, it would have been 11 years old. Wow. And I took that, like, personally. Like, I was, like, so distraught Damn. and upset by it. Like, you know, I, I just, I'd say, like, I, I genuinely thought music was, like, done. I didn't yeah. think there was Damn. ever going to think, remember. anything was ever going to come back. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I, I, I felt empty. And then I randomly saw the video months later, like, in the same year for Blind from Corn, And it was so Whoa. scary and aggressive to me. That I was like, this is so different. Like, my brain can't compute the idea of a world where Nirvana and Corn could have existed in the same right. world. But they, right. but for me, it was a torch path, and even though there's nothing in common whatsoever. It's interesting. But, yeah. Um. But for me personally, like, what I found was like, okay, this is something new for me. So whatever. And it's interesting. So now that we've worked with Ross, who did that first record and all of that in this cool full circle situation. I remember having like a really in-depth conversation with him about what I think drew me to corn and what drew me to his work and also what I'm still doing today, which is there was the vulnerability in Mm. all of that. You know, like you got Jonathan Davis crying on those records. You got all the stuff that he did. It's like all of that stuff, you feel the vulnerability in it. And that's what I think continued to drive me into finding hardcore and defining emo and defining all of this stuff. It's just like sifting through that and the imperfections and the voice cracking and, yeah. and all of that stuff. It's people who are really trying to say something. Yeah. I, I agree it's with really that. Interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I, I can, another example that. of that to me is that I feel like seven seconds, almost a lot of the drum beats were exactly the same, but every song was different in the message. I cared about the message more from seven seconds than I cared about the music, but every beat sounded like, it was on sure. Like everything was kind of the same when those walked together those first couple records before the they lyrics, went more melodic. But I agree. But it was like the, it was so it was the like, message to the me. The message was the lyrics so strong and the lyrics are yes. so powerful and and definitely had an effect on me much more than 
the actual music. Itself. Seven seconds too? Absol- no, absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent because it could be like, oh, they're right playing the same song. But the songs are so different from each other. Especially when he was talking about back yeah, then. Exactly. It was yeah. never talked about. And I thought that was the coolest thing about them. And they had great melodies too, though, even though the songs there's things that just stuck in your head and, and I I mean perfect. But I mean, you felt that, it, like he's talking about you felt that. Even yeah. the I can listen to Brace record and cry listen to it at this moment yeah, if I listen to Brace. It's the greatest recording and everything like that. But, but you it but you is, feel you feel it. Yeah. Ian's lyrics and his right. on that record. Oh my god! And that's bro. something with Ross that I thought was really interesting because he, he he pulls that out of bands. Like he really makes you go deep and yeah, and in search of why you're writing the song, why are you there in that moment? Like what is your purpose? You know, like really to think about that. Um, and that and that was something that I wanted to experience because I heard so much from those guys. They're like, oh, he did the Roots album. It was insane. We're doing all sorts of weird stuff that we had never done before, and just getting themselves out of the box and just being who they are you know a band coming from brazil embracing those elements and then he talked about other bands that he had worked with and i and i really admire that first corn album it was something i think had a huge influence on sepultura wow and and and, and especially with the tuning down and just that real deep sound you know really yeah insane sound but um and also ross played me some stuff that Corey had done you know, vocal tracks of him just singing. Oh, just really? Raw. Yeah, Ooh. like no music and just his vocals. And he's like, look, he's like, it's important, you know, to really grasp the song and know what you're you're writing about and, you know, to go deep on it. You have to be able to explain it to me. Yeah. And it has to make Feel sense it, don't to force yourself. It. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and when I heard, like, the shit that he had with, like, Corey, it was, like, insane, you know, like, just, like. How did me. you, I'm curious to hear how your experience was. Okay. Were you comfortable in the just Toby, so you know, like before you before <laughs> before you track yeah. a song with with Ross, like yeah. he makes you be in a room with your entire band yeah. and and read the lyrics line by line and explain what every yeah. single. He told me that he did yeah. it to you. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was. So the whole band knows it's, what the yeah. song's about. It's, exactly. it's it's open therapy. The whole thing. Wow. Yeah. How did you? How, That's kind of cool. The first time it happened for you, were you? Did you feel? Was it hard for you to open up and do it, or was it something that you were open to? Did did it take some time to get used to? No, I, I was open to do it. I thought it was it was kind of crazy, and I and I was like, <laughs> wow, that's something that makes sense. Like everybody should know what the song that you're playing is about. So everybody's and on the same page. Everybody was on the same page. Yeah. And they're like, ah, oh, oh, that's what it's about. You know, like or like for the first time, I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I never explained this to be. You know, the, yeah. The, bass player or drummer at the time because it's usually guitarist and I like Andreas writing the songs and, and going deep like okay that's what the song is about you know or that's the yeah. focus of the album that's the concept just a couple of us in the band but it was great to have everyone on the same page yeah and uh because band dynamics it's like you get so used to it's like you do your job I yeah, do my job exactly. you don't yeah. you've right. never like you've probably your band's probably never questioned what you've written because no. they because they don't right. think about it yeah right? because yeah and, yeah and that's how it all had always been with us it's just yeah. a trust put in your singer where they're gonna Absolutely. say what they need to say and then it's gonna sound good and that's what it is so having now everybody in the entire band know the you know fucking warts and all like what every single line is about i mean you do a thing where i'd say a line and i'd explain it and then he'd be like how does that make you feel and point to someone else wow and then, or like yeah or like Ross would tell a story about something really deep and then he, you know, would ask to someone else if they want to share something like that's you, intense. So yeah, you would, you'd yeah. be talking for, you know, there's just times you talk for like 90 minutes before you even, you were, and, and also, wow. yeah. also makes the singer sing every time just to get the drums. Really? Yeah. So everybody was playing. like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Singing all the whole time, everything. Yeah. I was like in the same room. Yeah. And I was like, yo, he's like, yeah, this room has no air conditioning. It's going to feel like you're <sighs> at a show. You know, like hot. You know, just be like sweating there. I was like, I still have to track vocals. You know yeah. that. And he's like, Yeah, you're gonna be warmed up. Yeah. Sometimes there's good stuff in there yeah. that you're doing that you can use later. And I was like, That's Did true. you wow? Did, did you ever talk wrong. to Did you ever talk to him about the microphone that you recorded in? Uh, yeah. yeah. That to me was. So he has this mic that's like a fucking tank, and he's like, every vocalist I've ever recorded used this one specific okay. mic, right? And I was like, oh my god. So I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, oh, this is when we first met him because we did a tryout with him first before we did the full record. So, okay. so when he pulls out this mic and he's like, he's like, yeah, man, every every record I've ever done has been on this thing, and I'm just, 
he doesn't know how much I know about him. Okay. I'm I'm playing it cool. Yeah. You know, I'm not like, hey, so like the time you did the fucking, you know, Cure record, whatever. Yeah. Like, I'm just. That's his band. He loves the Cure. Okay. And Dream he, band. And he did the self-titled record for them in like the mid 2000s. So like, I'm just like listening to him, you know, talk about it or whatever. And I was like, what's the backstory? Like, where did that mic come from? And he was like, well, good question. It was originally Nick Caves. Wow. And I was like, wow, okay. And he goes, uh, and the studio that I used to record out of, Indigo Ranch. Were you at Indigo Ranch? I didn't get to go. I there. didn't get to go yeah, there either. Yeah, yeah. It was already done. So he was like, it belonged to Indigo Ranch, which was this big studio that he yeah. did all the early records at. And he was like, um, he's like, but I mean, a ton of records not even involving me got recorded on this. And he was like, and he's like, you know, like Leonard Cohen's The Future was recorded on this. Wow. And my entire band just like turns their head and looks at me because I, that's oh. my, that's my guy. Okay. That's my he is my everything. Okay. Like I am, I live and die by the Cohen. Okay. Musically and, and, and <laughs> Leonard Cohen or <laughs> film wise, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joel and Ethan Cohen. Right. I live by the, <laughs> I live by that shit. So when he just casually says, you know, like Leonard Cohen sang the future on this, I was just like, fuck my life. Are you kidding me right now? And wow. I'm about to sour this microphone with my shit. <laughs> but, but the cool backstory, I was like, so how do you have it now? If it belonged to the studio, he, and he says, when, Indigo Ranch was finally shutting down and they were selling off all of their equipment. It was right when he got the Cure record. And the label said, what do you need from us to do the Cure record? And Ross said, you need to buy me that microphone. Damn. Which I think was like 30,000 bucks. Wow. Some crazy, about, yeah. some crazy, like when it's a lot we, of history, a lot of like, yeah, yeah, legends. When we were about to start the record with him, he had to buy a mic that was like $5,000 to break it to get the piece out of and another microphone to f- repair this one. Whoa. Whoa. We're just like, that's a fucking investment. Like how old is that microphone? Like what year? I wonder what it came from. Like, I'd idea. have to ask him. I'm assuming probably at least, at least fucking 50 plus years old. Damn, it sounds a, great. It yeah. sounds incredible. It's not like a sure I get some other kind no, of No, no. Yeah. It's a, I have a photo of it deep in my phone. I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you. It's like a fucking tank, man. I think the funnest thing, like from recording with him, like the, out of nowhere, like sitting there, because this place is right on Venice Beach, like literally, like boardwalk. Oh, he told me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I'm sitting outside, like during vocals, taking a break, getting some air, and I'm like, ah, and then all of a sudden there's like too short, rolls up, like, <laughs> yo, what's happening? And I was like, uh, he's like, there's a studio in there? I was like, uh, yeah. And he's like, mind if I check it out? And I was like, uh, yeah, no way. Just like, randomly <laughs> walked in. <laughs> I was like, too short. Is it? And then I tried the. My band is just like, mm, they have no idea. Yeah, like, that's incredible. Was like, he was like, oh, this is cool. This is tight. And I was like, it's like too short. Like, I want to hear the Ross Robinson too short record. <laughs> Dude, I want to hear that. I was like, yo, Ross, you should record. With Has me. he done hip hop? Ross? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, he's done some adjacent stuff. <laughs> what did he he's or, done, he did corn a, be one of them? No. He did a vanilla ice that's metal. right that's right he did a vanilla yeah. new oh metal. she did that that's metal legit. record he did that metal record yeah. no way yeah. dude yeah. that's right he, I wonder how that was oh I think he did he might have done like a get Ross out here for God's okay, 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 okay. he might have done like a Tech 9 record or something like yeah. that too. yeah dude he's gotta be on here for sure yeah. You, he's like no one else he's, yeah. Yeah. he's, he's super cool right yeah. genuinely Yo, he's plant based guru is he oh, he is years. the most interesting person you'll you'll ever talk to absolutely damn a mini, mini of story. You're you're gonna go down a rabbit hole with him. Okay, Game I would love that. You're gonna love him. You're gonna love him. I forgot the name of the guy that did the Hazen Street record. He was a big producer too. He did Pod, My Chemical mm-hmm. Romance. I think I might. Um, be, uh, um, he's pretty much a look at your phone. He did the Hazen record. He's a huge. He's a huge producer. I, he said his name to me before. I know. I know. It was like uh, it's. No, I always get confused with that guy you're mentioning, but no. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he did so many big records. Pod, My Chem. Look it up, look it up. The guy who did our, the Hades rig, he was interesting too. Mackie came in and did like all of his parts in like one take. He was like, dude, who the fuck is this guy? I'm like, yo, that's Mackie from the Chromax and Batman's. <laughs> like Mackie just killed this shit the one day, man. He billied anything to say to Mackie about like any of his stuff. Like we were there for a couple, for a while, but I don't know, I forget his name. Sorry about this, Joe. But he's, a, he's a big producer too. Howard Benson. Howard Benson. Howard Benson. Oh, Howard Benson. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, that was the producer of the record. Yeah, Dude, he he did the first album I did with Sepultura. He did. Yes. <laughs> he he wore sweatpants. <laughs> yeah. Picked his nose and drove a Beamer. That's all I remember about him. <laughs> Shout out to Howard. Yeah, I love you, Howard. Oh, he was my he, God. I love, he was so interesting, man. He's a he's a so very interesting. interesting. Wow. We know him from Motorhead. 
Okay. Because the manager of Motorhead started managing us. And then he was like, I know a guy, Howard Benson, should produce your first wow. album. I was like, all right. And Howard was he amazing. Black Parade. I think the big ass Mike Hem record, he, man. He, no, he he blew the hell up. Okay. Like, at, like After Mike Hem? I think he did us in 90, 98. So then after that, he blew up. Yeah. Like, he really blew up because he, when he was working with us, he just started. He was like, I got this thing called Pro Tools. Oh, yeah. Wow. Right. And he was like, I'm working with it. And it seems to be. So we did half the album in analog and half the other half in like Pro Tools. Yeah. Because he was learning it. Totally. Totally. And then he got huge. He did yeah. like Zebrahead or the Spanish. It's yeah, a, a rap rap rock band. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was doing them around the same time. <laughs> totally. I remember that Zebra. Band, yeah, that, yo, that band is huge in the UK. Still? Yeah. Really? Huge in the oh, UK. Those guys, are, I love those guys. They were funny, man. Yeah. Zebrahead. Yeah, Zebrahead guys. It's crazy seeing bands like in Europe and to see them here. It's totally different worlds. We're huge in Belgium. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it's back to Shay Moray. Uh, who came up with the name? You did. I did. Nice. Yeah. It's a great name. Touché. Is you guys going tour GB? Yes. Wow. To Europe or something? Or yes. yes. Yeah. Remember that? I can't remember that. That was that was really fun. Oh. Yeah. Really fun. That was Did you share a bus with them or something? Was it like something like that? We did not. No, we did not. But it was it was a lot of bands on it. It was like uh called Together Fest. That's right, Together Fest, yep. So it was uh Gorilla Biscuits, Touche, Modern Life is War, uh Miles Away. That was that was like the core yeah. band on it. Um but yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun. I mean, being around those guys is is yeah. is, is awesome. It was, <laughs> some of the guys in my band are less hardcore affiliated. Okay. Right? Uh so they they might have been going into that being like, man, are these guys a bunch pretty much are like fucking tough guys. Like, New York. Like, yeah. Like are we are we gonna vibe with these guys? Like whatever. And immediately met Arthur. Arthur's oh, the best. I love Arthur. Shout and, out to Smelios. I love you, Smelios. Yeah. And, <laughs> and immediately was like, oh my God, you have tattoos about like having a tattoo of the cat. Oh yeah. And all the guys in my band were like, oh yeah, we're good. Like, this is this is the bad. sweetest person in the it's entire sweetest. world. Like, Shout out to like, Arthur, man. I fucking yeah. love you. Yeah. I miss him and I have not unfortunately seen him in a really long time, but I would love to give a big hug to that man. When I lost my apartment in Queens, I moved in with him and his dad and his sister. I lived in his bedroom. Yeah, what? thank you, Arthur. Took no me to Astoria, way. Queens. That's yeah, nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, Astoria, Queens. Thank you, Arthur. You're a fucking legend, Arthur. Oh my um, God. So let's go back to Touche. So you guys, you guys put the seven inch out, then you put the first record out, two thousand nine. Yep. Right, and then start touring. Like, full, is it become when, yeah. you, when you first put your first record? You guys already have a buzz. You guys are already playing crazy shows. You already. It, it was like a groundswell sort of situation. Like, you know, we made a demo that. We didn't think anyone outside of our friend group would ever hear, yeah. you know? And we started doing sort of like West Coast. We did a couple like short West Coast runs, started making friends with some bands that were like more sonically in line with us. That's cool. Um, and then I had a prior relationship with the band Thursday. Nice. Who play a very big role in us getting anything. Would they, where, be, would they be considered Screamo? Adjacent, okay. yeah, adjacent. like, right. like there, right. you there you go, there you go. That's that's that's, that's closer. There was okay. a take it back Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. but thir- Thursday more because they had a bit no shots fired, but they're a bit more elevated. Okay. Than some of that stuff. Okay. Um. So anyway, they, I, I Thursday was one of my all time favorite bands. Awesome. I, I I I made like a fan website for them, and that's cool. And saw them on their first West Coast tour, and just we just hit it off, and they always. To this day, the same people I met that day. That's cool. They are today just the best people. Yeah. Um. So throughout my years, like I would, I would give Jeff my shitty bands demos, and he would be like, "Thanks, but probably, <laughs> you know how it goes, <laughs> like whatever." So then I, I when I started Touche, I gave him the demo, and he was like, "Yeah." He he told me the story where they put it on the bus, and everybody was like, "The fuck is this?" And he was like, "Dude, this is Jeremy's band," and everyone was like. Yo, like, okay. <laughs> wow. And That's so, awesome. so my best friend uh, did a label called 6131 Records yep. that put out our first record. And Jeff, wanted, Jeff, the singer of Thursday, wanted to be involved. So it's kind of a split, kind of a split release between the two of them. And then Thursday took us on our first full US tour doing first of four. And that was where we learned everything. Like yeah. I, my other bands had done DIY tours and I, and Touche had done a, bunch, a lot of DIY tours, but it's not until you're like in those yeah. situations oh, where yeah, you're right. like, you know, we one of the jokes that we always talk about is like, you know, the first time you're loading into a venue like that, you don't know how to fucking properly sound check. You don't know any of that shit. Nah. So you have a venue staff being like, oh, you guys need to put your deads over there. And we're like, yeah, for sure. The fuck are deads? What 
the fuck does that mean? So you know, true. And then someone had to come up and be like, it's, it's when your cases are empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So count, like, count your merch and give 30% to House of Blues. <laughs> Also, it's reality. Like, barricades. Yeah, no, totally oh man. Real. Yeah, you have someone eventually be like, you probably shouldn't put, you probably shouldn't roll and put masking tape on your t-shirts. <laughs> Shit like that. Yeah, Shit that you're yeah. so used to doing because you you see other bands doing, you think that's the way to do it. To like roll up your fucking t-shirt, you think it's gonna save space. It's not. It's, it's a, making yeah. more. It's a disaster. It's and such also, a different reality, man. Now there's gunk on these t-shirts. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> also, you'll probably like this. I, I've always been saying, you could look at. Uh, the arc of a band's of a punk band's career by the price of their t-shirts yeah when you start eight bucks totally right then eventually it's like eight to ten you know because you're you have punk rock guilt and 100%. you know and you know how much that shit costs to make 100 percent. and then eventually you're like i think we can get away with 12 and we can get away with 12 and then you start doing it 12 and then you're like fuck dealing with singles what a pain in the ass it helps for the tip jar yeah, but dealing right. with singles is a pain in the ass. Yeah, and then you know it's a couple years in, you're you're starting to open up bigger tours, and you're like, everyone else is selling their shirts for twenty. Yeah, I guess we could do fifteen. But Let's do fifteen. Then you, you kind of get you, you can't under you can't undersell the band the price. It. Yeah, because it because then you're like, but then you're like, you know, I think we can still do fifteen. I, you know, we're opening like no one wants to spend a lot of money. We'll do fifteen. Everyone else is twenty. We'll do fifteen. That'll be cool. <laughs> and and then you're dealing with a lot of fives, and it's annoying as hell. And then eventually, you're now been a band for like ten plus years, and you're like, I think we can do twenty. Let's do twenty dollars t-shirts, so right? So true, dude. And then, and then eventually, where we are now, you know, price of things, everything is more it's expensive. Twenty five bucks, thirty bucks is it's a pretty T-shirt. common thing, right? 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 Yeah. But do you know what the do you know what the phenomenon is this whole time? Your audience doesn't give a shit. They don't give a shit. You've created this idea. Yeah, such that, such a great point, yeah. man. You've created this idea that fucking. You know, you're going to get judged right. by trying to be a capitalist, all of this sort of stuff. But the entire time, your audience wants to support you they and do. give you give you $15. They do. They're not going to ask how and much yeah, this print costs. The bands deserve it. Yeah. It's maybe true. in the Bay. Maybe if you play Gilman, they might ask about how much De- your shirt costs. Yeah. De- 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 <laughs> but, yeah. But, but otherwise, your people just want to support you. It is so true. Like like three months ago, I did a drop. I sold a, a grip of sweatshirts mm-hmm. and my price was very 90s mm-hmm. and there was barely any profit right and my wife and my band i was telling about it, they're like dude so i started looking at other hardcore bands online what they're selling their hoodies for yeah it was like 25 dollars more or something yeah and i just totally played myself yeah. because of that exact thing you just broke down right there i'm like i'm yeah, living yeah. in like the past with, with right. prices and stuff you know what i mean i did that then i just released more and i, and I bumped the prices up to what other people they were doing it. and nobody said shit right that's a great point but punk my rock, whole life yeah punk rock, punk rock guilt no punk rock guilt is not far off from christian guilt yeah. i swear to god it's the same shit <laughs> it's the same it's like the same, like if you were ever a christian and then you became an atheist when you say out loud i don't fucking believe in god there's a part in your head that goes Ooh. yeah <laughs> You know, like, did, like, did, 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 did you hear that? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, Lord, like, yeah. Lord, I was just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. It's true, though. Yeah, punk rock, to, com- yeah. punk rock guilt gets fucking deep in you, man. And, and you don't have that because you're in a fucking metal band, I, and everybody spends crazy, but they don't care about that shit. And and that's something I grew to understand very quickly. You know, it's just like you're working very hard. You know, as a musician, sacrificing artist, so many things, sacrificing so many things, and, and I, so many musicians. That, you know, it's like knowing your worth and not, being, your worth. And not being afraid to, to say that. Even, you know, a person who's a painter or whatever, and they're like, ah, I'm going to have it like not so expensive. I'm an art. But, uh, <laughs> that, out. that was weird. But, uh, but it's important to really know your worth and, the, and, and to say it, you know, yeah. and be representative of that. It, and, and I think it's important for musicians to understand that. It's, it's not it's, something everyone's doing. Yeah. It's yeah. all. Your voice just went up a lot. Yeah, it just did. That's okay. It's, yeah, your voice is back. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Also, like, it's not necessarily our fault because we're also because it's a it's a it's an internal problem because when you start out touring, you're getting paid 100, 150 bucks, hundred bucks Facts. a night, whatever. Facts, yeah. You're used to living small. That's yeah. true. And not and so it's it's uh it's built in and yeah. and uh, I think it adds character. Hundred percent, for sure. 100%. And I wouldn't, tra- I wouldn't trade any of that shit. Same, um, neither would I. Same, but you value money you value, a lot better, for yeah. sure. I agree. So Absolutely. when when your band all of a sudden the first time gets like a, yo, you're gonna get a thousand bucks to play the show, you're just like, 
<laughs> what? <laughs> large? What? <laughs> yeah. What? I'm a close to retirement. Yeah. <laughs> what was there? So, yeah. I mean, all of those things start to mean more, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, anyway. But, anyway. Um, so, you guys, in between doing Touche, you're also doing Deadhead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's I haven't thought about that in a while. Correct. Like, like, yeah. like in yeah. between records, it's like 2009 and 2010, you Deadhead. Then 2011, you do uh, Touche more. Then you go back to Touche more. Then you go back to... Yeah. Yeah. Deadhead, Deadhead was Deadhead was mostly members of Touche, but yeah. we just switched instruments. Like I play guitar, cool. bass player sang. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Um, bass player sang. Uh, other guitar player was also a guitar player. Our buddy Alex, who like has recorded so much Touche stuff, like he did our first record. He does all of our pre-pro demos. He's our guy. He played drums. Um, it was just like a fun like D beat crust band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did that for like not, we did a couple seven inches and one ten inch. Yeah. That's cool. Staying busy though. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you've been doing music for like a full time for a long time. A really long time. Yeah, Be- I, before I just, the label. Y- yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's just you know. I think for a lot of us who we just don't know how to do anything else proper. Yeah. Okay. I think I think that when you, I don't mean this as a slight to people to people who get straight jobs while also trying to fulfill their art and their I, dreams. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, but I think there's something about people who don't know better right. and you just learn how to get by just and hustle yeah, man. and you and you same because you're you just have to accept like look i might just literally be eating top ramen for the next month and a half but i'm doing what you love but but i get to go play shows with my friends yeah, yeah. and whatever and and uh it's true you know and so that just kind of continues to this day i mean it's like you know touche certainly isn't gonna fucking buy me a house anytime in my life but you know, at the same time, like I do the podcast, I do yeah, my label, record, I do, yeah. I do, I release poetry books. I do, I yeah. do shit like that. That like is just extra income. That it's not a lot, but it's it it helps me keep the lights on and the creative and the creative. Yeah, going. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, were there some big moments, Patouche, where you thought maybe the band was going to be a certain level or certain records you know, that like really hit? You know. Can I be the worst and ask for a pee break? I chug, yeah, yeah, I chug, yeah, yeah, I chug, yeah, yeah, yeah. I chug the biggest no, coffee no, I on do, my way here. I do it all the time. Okay. Oh, we're back from the, the pee break. We were talking to Jeremy about <laughs> when um, Touche was huge on MTV. They, had, they were selling millions of records. <laughs> they crossed over. They sold the their groupies. shirts for $50. Lots of groupies. Um, on the Warp Tour. Did you guys ever do Warp Tour? <laughs> no, right. <laughs> no. Warp Tour was over by then. Well, oh, no, okay. no, no, no. I, I, there was a public kerfuffle. Uh, where <laughs> I uh, I spoke my mind. Oh wow! Oh, I didn't even fucking know that. Okay. That's I mean, in my notes. No, it, 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 so it's, that's all right. It wasn't. Yeah, it's not Wikipedia worthy. I don't think. But <laughs> it was a lesson learned for me. Where if I want to, uh, everything's you big. spoke out uh, your 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 opinions on that, that tour. I guess it was. Yes. Okay. Okay. It was a situation where I think I was being interviewed. It was for the LA Weekly. Oh, okay. And it was a learning lesson for me mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. everything you say. They're gonna probably find the part that's the most interesting and make that the headline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I did this interview, and towards the end, the the gentleman was like, "Hey, do you think Touche will ever do Warp Tour?" And I said, "Fuck no." And oh, shit. and he okay. was like, "Why?" And I was like, "I had I known it was gonna be the focus of the article, yeah, that's, I would have yeah. been a little more thoughtful with mm. how I wanted to approach it." Yeah, but because I thought. Oh, it's the interview's over. I'm just I thought this was a throwaway question and I'm just gonna be a, a loud mouth about it. Yeah. I still feel very strongly about how I what I said. Yeah. But I would have in the context been a little more generous overall. I basically was just like, why would I want to spend my summer with like a bunch of like ninety nine percent of fucking misogynistic piece of shit bands? Whoa. Um, and ninety nine percent is not a it's not a it's not a fair figure. Right. There's a lot of ska there's a lot of ska bands. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but and that, that went crazy. But at that time, there was a lot of a lot of bands that they were doing as headliners. I did not fundamentally agree with what yeah, they yeah, were what okay. they were about. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, the headline came out and it was like, Touche Amore says I'll never play Warp Tour, and then you know the 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 the, the gist of it was there. Yeah. But I I would have been a lot more thoughtful mm-hmm. in my delivery. Um, and then I got into a big public spat with Alternative Press about it. Oh, wow. Ooh, alternative um, Press. The gentleman who used to be the editor, Scott Heisel, um, mm-hmm. we got into it about it. Because we it was just before we were about to go out with AFI. What year was this? 2013. Okay. Um, and yeah, it was like a situation where Scott Heisel 
on like the alternative press Facebook or something was like really disappointed in Jeremy because I'll bet if you would have asked him about touring with AFI 10 years ago, he would have probably said the same thing. And I was like, I was like, you, you, this is what? what this so wildly different situations. Totally different situations <laughs> I was like, what man. are you even talking? I was, you know, whatever. I was like, listen, man, like I know that fucking tour sells your magazine. So you got to stand up uh, for it. But, um, and that was I, like an online thing you had. Yeah. Too? Wow. Which, you know, I'm fucking not too old for any of that type of shit these days, but yeah. But it was it was a learning moment for me where I was like, you know what? Uh, be more thoughtful about who you're talking to, yeah. and uh, I, I have a problem of oversharing. That's mm-hmm. that's a problem I think I have. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so that was a situation where I was like, you know what? Were you doing this to prove a point? Were you doing this to seem impressive? Were you, to, right. you know, like what was yeah. my motive for like wanting to go that hard? Right. For this thing that again, I I. I still never would would have wanted to do warp tour, but at the same time, like I could have been more generous and thoughtful in my approach of yeah. how I wanted to express my feelings, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. also at the same time, I I think I even reiterated, I was like, "Yo, we have friends that are on warp tour like this year. Like, no disrespect to them, they they're <laughs> grinding, they gotta right. make their money, and yeah. they and they, you know, it's an opportunity. Um, yeah. Also, if I wanted to be a diva about it, you want me to play at eleven a.m. some days? You can fuck off. <laughs> I'm awake at 11. You kidding me right now? Yeah. You make a band play. You don't know what time you're going to play every day. And all of a sudden, they're just True. like, yo, you got to go play at 1130 right you're now. You're checking at 10 a.m. every morning and see what time you play. You know that, right? Uh, yeah, I heard it. doesn't matter what that. band you are. I saw Blink, play at, saw Blink play at noon once. Wow. doesn't matter, man. Yeah, yeah. it's very, yeah. Wow. How do fans find out the same day? They yeah, say, they just got to be there sure, early. Be there, and then they just, they just put up a sign that says like what the running order is. Yeah. That shit oh, is, so everybody has to be there super early. Yeah. yeah. Or you can miss the band that you want to see. Totally. Yeah. Just, wow. just hanging out on fucking blacktop concrete, and, yeah. And, Such a weird and, and hoping that your fucking band you're gonna see is not conflicting with another band. At yeah, you, and then you play uh, against each other too. Uh, I remember some forty one had that huge single, but before they had signed their contract and deal to be on the Warp Tour, they got a certain amount of money to play in a flatbed truck, and then they would have like twenty thousand people, the most people watching them. Every day on the flatbed truck because they had a huge song on the radio. Whoa. And they were just on that flatbed, man, every day, bro. All different times of the day. Because that's what they signed up for. This right. The record hadn't blown up yet until yeah. they were on a warp tour. Crazy shit like that. It was a fucking. I missed that whole warp tour phase. I wasn't even. You miss it? Oh, you missed Oh, you missed it. I yeah. never saw it. You were in the country. Yeah. Is there a big difference between that and Ozfest as far as the bands probably don't play against each other? Maybe they do. I don't know. I, I mean, when I joined. Uh, we never did an Ozfest. It was something that happened before I was in the band that they did. So I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. it was probably wrapping up around that time. Yeah. I think the last one was like 2000 or something, 2001 maybe or right. something, but like still, yeah, anyway. But it, So back to Touche, but was there a moment or a time or record or one of your things that you released? Or? I don't think we've ever had a moment where the band was bigger than it ever was. I think that I'm thankful for the fact that we, I think there's something graceful in plateauing yeah you know um yeah and i'm fine with that and still uh, being here and still playing yeah like yeah. like you earn enough of a of a base to where you can rely on those people and they can rely on you um yeah they're i'm one of the biggest honors of my entire fucking musical life is that it's a heavy debate with our audience on their favorite records in order mm-hmm. that's one of the that's I can't think of anything cooler in the entire world that there's people who think that our latest record is our best record. That's awesome. And there's people who think our latest record is our second best, our fourth best. It's cool. It's a big debate. The people that my least favorite record is a lot of people's favorite record. That happens. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um so you That's know, interesting. That's a that's a huge like I can't think of a cooler honor in the entire world. And then there's always always the people who are gonna say the fucking demo is the best thing we ever did, <laughs> yeah. you know? And that's or cool like too. The first album. Yeah, that's cool yeah. too. That's cool too. Um, so the man was the last one in 2020. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was a great response. And yeah, it went really, it went really, really well. Um, critically, it was, it, you know, uh, we we're one of the few bands that I f- we are lucky to p- you know choose your words with who, if you want to call it lucky, but Pitchfork covers us. So like, yeah. So like our third record, they gave us an 8.0. Our fourth record, they gave us an 8.1, and then <laughs> our last record. 
It was an 8.2. So in 18 more records, buddy, we're going to have a fucking 10. We're getting 0.1% better in Pitchfork Eyes every time. Every time, Do maybe. you read all the reviews of your band throughout your career? You I pay tr- attention I to really that I really try not to. I, I was gonna I'll, add, yeah. I'll, look, I'll look at the if there's like a star rating. Whoa. I'm guilty of doing that. <laughs> you go, you know the term pain, oh like pain diving. You go, right. yeah, you go looking to get your hurt, your feelings hurt. Yeah. Pain diving, yeah. bro. That's a great term. Yeah, you just so go, the stars. I remember, I remember, like uh, Alternative bro, Press had that, that too. Stuff. All those uh, ratings. back in the day, the ratings. I will say this, Alternative Press. I had this big pub- public spat with their head editor. Our record came out three months after that. And they were very favorable wow. about it, which all things aside, I was like, you know what? Stand up move. Like you could have used this opportunity totally to just mm-hmm. give us shit a fucking yeah. point, right. point one sort of, you know, half star shit. <laughs> um, oh, they go out of their way to just talk really bad. There's actually when a, it's like half star. It's like, whoa. There's a really funny actual, it's on the internet interaction where Alternative Press invited me to, <laughs> oh, no. to interview, um, the singer of Manchester Orchestra and the singer and Kevin Devine um, at Riot Fest, I think it was. Yeah. So it was like, hey, do you want to interview these two guys for for uh, for whatever? And I just looked at it like I'm a huge Manchester fan. Like now we've got like he's the singer of Manchester sings on our latest record. Like That's we're like awesome. tight, we're tight, good friends. Yeah. But that was one of the first times we ever really met in person. I had known Kevin Devine a little bit, who's a great singer songwriter. They have a band together called Bad Books, which I think is what they would have been promoting. But it was a fun, it was really funny because on camera in the thing, as soon as we start, one of them, I think Kevin Devine goes, or one of them just goes, weren't you guys just beefing like last week? Wow. Kind of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a thing. And it was just like, yeah, yeah. He just straight called it out in the interview. Was which, Scott there too? No. He, yeah, he was wow. behind the camera. He's like, weren't you guys like just beefing? <laughs> like, <laughs> Holy shit. That's cool. It worked out. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Damn. Funny so shit. So also you did that you did that live at the region tour. I remember you played those shows at ten ten years a thousand. We did ten years and then this uh twenty twenty three we did our fifteen year. Fifteen years. Wow. Man. Which is crazy. It's so crazy, man. Time Still flies, doing music, man. man. It's like I was I'm mad too because like okay our band like specifically my guitar player and I were like extremely we're archivists to the deepest degree. Okay. Like if you go to touchemore.com, you can look at every show we've ever played, that's wow, all that's the bands great. we played with. Ian McKay style. That's I love yeah, that. Man. It, we, I update it every time we play a show. That's mm-hmm. so cool. Um, our discography on there like is very like all the pressings, backstory, trivia, the whole shit. Awesome. It's very Damn. in depth, right? Um, and uh, where am I going with this? So our ten year anniversary was also lined up to be our one thousandth show. One thousand show. It was one thousand show. On our ten year anniversary, the same day. That's cool. We wow. lined it up to be the same day, et cetera. The whole it's like that's just like how our brain works. Yeah. And then fucking the shutdown happened, so our fifteen year show is only like our twelfth hundred show. I was like, <laughs> we lost so many fucking, we lost so many shows before because of that year. You know what I'm wow. saying? Like we we were on such a steady pace of playing like two hundred plus shows a year. You brought the flyer still from all the shows. Oh, uh, so we put so. Um, on the ten year anniversary of our first record, we put out this huge deluxe book where we did, um, where we re recorded the record because there's new members in the band, and obviously you play faster, you play yeah. tighter. You, it's, uh, I had some bad grammar that I fixed, <laughs> some bad grammar that I fixed right. that was driving me crazy. <laughs> that I was like, I'm gonna fix this shit. Um, <laughs> so we re recorded it, but then also we included the original recording too. So there's both versions, and it's deluxe book, and the book has. All the flyers, oh, all of our, cool, all man. of our T-shirts, all of our Fuck. fucking everything, every photo, emails of our, our guitar player quitting. Also, we it goes oh. deep. It goes deep. You're super organized at home too. Your life is everything. Everything's organized and yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. not OCD, but I mean it, it's, it's non-diagnosed. <laughs> non-diagnosed. Yeah, 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 say yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, everything's organized. Records, everything. All else, that. So. Yeah, it's it's absurd. This it's is absurd. weird. This is a weird question. Were you in a Weird Al Yankovic movie? I was. Yeah, yeah. You, you played the guitarist. I play. I, so there's a fake punk band in it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I got to play that. I got to be in that. Yeah. It's, how does it's, how does that happen? So, I'm sure you've had this with your podcast where maybe you interview a stranger and then down the line something really cool happens because of it. Yeah. So, um, I interviewed uh a, the director of it. His name is Eric Appel, who hadn't done a feature yet. Okay. But he had done he'd done a bunch of tv shows and a bunch of syndicated tv and and all of that sort of stuff um so he, and he has an amazing story where like 
Do you remember the Andy Milanaka show? Yeah. yeah. That was his yeah. roommate, and they developed that show together wow. out of high school or wow. whatever, right? So that's, that's where crazy. he got his start. Okay. And did, you know, he did episodic TV, like he did a, like in the, in my interview with him, he like walks me through what it was like to uh, direct an episode of The Office, which is really cool. And that's it's really cool. fun to hear. That's awesome. Um, so we got along great, and it was a really great interview. Um, and maybe timeline's a little fuzzy but like within the next few months i remember reading the article eric capel set to direct this weird al yankovic biopic and i was like good for eric that's fucking sick you know i'm not gonna reach out to him because we're not i don't know him that well he just was nice enough to come on my show so i was like that's awesome good for eric and then it was within days of that announcement he texted me saying um are you free on these two days and is your head still shaved (laughs) and i said um Yes, I can be free, and yeah, my head is still shaved. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's up? And he was like, "Well, there's going to be a scene in this film where Weird Al tries out for a punk band, oh, man. and they make fun of him and don't let him in. <laughs> and then, then he goes, and, then he goes, and you see the band performing live, and the crowd boos them and hates them. And then Weird Al goes up and cr- kills it like a very like t- <laughs> typical like because the movie's like a rift on making fun of biopics. Basically, yeah, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's it's no, like it's, see it it's satirizing." biopics okay. right um so anyway uh he's like yeah i already he's like the other two guys are known comedians it's jonah ray and johnny pemberton he's like but weird al asked me specifically if i know anybody who actually like looks like they play in a punk band <laughs> and i was like i was like i'm fucking That's in so cool. it was amazing everyone was so nice like i got to meet a lot of really cool people weird al was the coolest person in the entire world really yeah. stressful situation though because i'm a fucking boy scout where leading up to it uh i was like so what are we playing like are, are we playing to a backing track yeah like, right. like are, we lip, are we lip syncing are yeah, we making yeah. whatever and the, and eric was like oh we'll figure it out on the day it's like what <laughs> no and so uh johnny and jonah happen to also be musicians okay so um <laughs> and we don't know each other but we have a we're a, a huge venn diagrams like johnny pemberton was good friends with riley gale of okay. power trip okay and so we i never met johnny but i knew we had that in common yeah. uh jonah ray has i mean he's a ton of mutual friends like but all punk, punk bands yeah, and whatever yeah. else like he plays in a in a weird al cover band where, <laughs> oh, wow. where they do where they do the i think it's like i think they do the um the not uh satirized versions like that like yeah, the yeah. actual weird al songs but he does them like punk that's cool whatever and that's he cool. and he and the people who play in that band i know so anyway so we get into text chain and i was like what are we doing so i start fucking writing riffs and shit because i'm like <laughs> i'm the guitar player in the band i'm not the singer in, yeah, the, in yeah. this thing so i'm I'm like writing riffs and sending them and we're like yeah this is cool yeah this so fucking work whatever <laughs> so we show up on the day and weird al already knows jonah and johnny because of comedy he doesn't know me but we walk yeah. up and he's like jonah uh, Johnny, so nice to meet you. He's like, Jeremy, it's so nice to meet you. He gives me a huge hug. He's just the nicest person. And he was, and then he goes, let me teach you the song. Oh. And I instantly panic because right. I, as mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, yeah, power I know power chords. chords. Yeah. This man is a musical genius. I'm yeah. like, is he about to try to make me learn some shit that I'm not qualified for? Yeah. And uh, so he he goes up to John, to John. He's like, this is what you're going to sing. And then he's like, what key is that in? Then he looks at me and he goes, guitar player, what key is that? Uh, and I just smiled. This is my reaction. I was just like, <laughs> I just smiled. I was like, like I'm in a punk band. And then, I, and then I slowly <laughs> reached for the instrument as if I was gonna figure it out, knowing that someone else would figure it out before I get to the. I'm like, oh, let me. Uh... Anyway, um, it was so. Then he teaches us this. He teaches us what we're gonna play. Um, it ended up just being like three chords. It was okay. It was super easy, thankfully. Okay. Um. And he's like, all right, let's run it. We're in a, It's in a venue. We're in a room full of extras and camera crew and stuff. And we're like, all right, let's run the song. Damn. It changes every single time because obviously we've never played music together. We're just like <laughs> trying this shit out. We're like, uh. And um, also the guitar they gave me, all respect to the prop house. Yeah. The strings had never, never been changed. <laughs> never been changed. Uh, these are like the. Th- this feels like the guitar I had in like seventh grade. Yeah, where yeah, I was yeah. like, it's also. <laughs> they probably got it like a flea market. Dude, dude, this something. thing was, this thing had never been cleaned. Uh, this no, like, work, dude. Damn. This thing was used as a prop, not to be played. Partridge right. family yeah, back yeah, in the yeah, day. Partridge totally family. Uh, they gave me they no tuner. 
I don't have a tuner, yeah. so I'm using like the guitar tuna app on my fucking yeah, yeah. on my on my phone to tune this thing. Um, uh, it's buzzing so loud, like you turn on. It was like a Marshall head. I turn on, it's just like, Bruh. and they're like quiet on the set. I'm just like, I, I literally can't do anything about this. Um, and then so we learn the song, and then they go, all right, now we're gonna introduce you to your to the stunt to the stunt team who are gonna fight you. So then I have to learn how to choreograph a fight with the audience who are going to revolt against us. Wow. So guys get up on stage and I like they like try to fight or take us take our instruments That's from us. Awesome. So this is all in my first I'm time. Watch this tonight, man. My first time ever being on fucking camera doing fucking anything. Yeah. I, I, I have uh, the, my buddy who is on my show tomorrow. When I told him this story because he's an actor, like I said, he was like, "That is the most stressful first time on camera thing I've ever heard. You're having to learn a song, perform it, and then <laughs> deal with fighting people in the audience. Also." The heckler in the scene that's so we play to an audience we finish the song and the audience is just dead quiet <laughs> and then Patton oswald who i'm a massive fan oh, of yeah, yeah. has a cameo where he's in the crowd and he goes you guys suck <laughs> <laughs> so my first time on camera i'm playing poorly this song that we just learned and then it gets quiet and then one of my favorite comedians of all time who i didn't get a chance to meet because he was injured and it was a whole thing in yeah. covid tells us we suck <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, then, and then the crowd revolts so that was yeah it was it was a whole thing it was fucking crazy what, what is that on to watch for the listeners um i i think you could just i think it's like a vod situation you probably just have to pay five bucks on amazon or something okay. like that because it was for um uh, oh god you can find it, so we can find it somewhere yeah definitely anyway so secret voice is your imprint to death wish yes. and that was like 2012 Yes. Sorry, but I think that's cool because you grew up going to that record store and then working at a record store and like kind of be, being kind of behind the scenes at first before you really started doing music full time. And then you, it's awesome. I don't know. So, yeah. And the backstory there <coughs> is basically like I had a really close relationship with Death Wish. And it was one of those situations you've, I'm sure both of you have been this, in this boat before where you get on a label, you're friendly with a label, you want your friends who are in good bands to be on better labels. So you try, yeah. so you pitch the label yeah. you're on bands you know what i'm saying yeah so um i was doing the thing where i kept being like yo you should sign this band yo you should sign this band you should sign this band and they and they awesomely enough picked up a few of those bands that That's i suggested cool. right yeah and, and those did pretty well on the, on death wish yeah so there was a band that opened for touche in canada that i was so floored by i mean no disrespect to the local bands on shows but when you're on tour you're on tour for a long time you might not check out the band that's playing first. It's true. It's very know? true. So we're still selling our own merch at the time or whatever. So I'm setting up the merch. I'm like getting, I think we were late. I'm setting up the merch table like in a hustle <laughs> as this band takes the stage and is all, you know, merch is being sold in the live room. And within a minute of this band set, I was like, what is this? This is the coolest band I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Uh, they're called Single Mothers. And they, cool s- they sound like if, if you're familiar with like the Hold Steady or any, a band like that, like okay. it's, it's very elevated, aggressive, post hardcore type stuff. It's very singular, very of itself. And I also really like the Hold Steady. So I watched the set and I'm floored and the singer comes off stage and I was like, you like the Hold Steady? And he just smiled really big, missing a tooth. And he's like, they're my favorite band. I was wow. like, fuck yeah. So we, <laughs> we hit it off. So eventually I get back in touch with them and I go to Death Wish and I say, I have this very strong feeling that I can't just hand this band off. I want to be a part of this. Like, I believe in this band so much that I want to be a part of it. Yeah. What do you guys feel about letting me have an imprint here? And uh, so the owners of Death Wish are Jake Bannon and Trey McCarthy. Uh, and Trey goes, mm, I'll have to ask Jake about it. It might be, hold on one second. And then he's like, hey, Jake, do you care if Jeremy has an imprint? And far away, you hear just Jake, you hear Jake go, I don't give a shit. <laughs> he's like, all right, yeah. I'm from Converge. I know. Okay. And, he, and he's, like, he's like, yeah, we're good. He's like, we'll do it. That's so fucking he let me, awesome. He let me do their seven inch and then they went on to do really well. They, they ended up, I take, some labels I think are offended by, I take pride in so many of the bands on my label going on to a label after that. Like yeah. I try to be the stepping, I'm happy to be a stepping stone. Yeah. Like so happy. Like I put out records for Drug Church. I put out records for uh, his band Gouge Away who's now, uh, they've been on Death Wish. Yeah. Uh, I put out Soul Glow who are now on Epitaph. Yeah. I put out, you know, it's like there's all these things I really fucking believe in and I just want to, I just want to help. I just want to be the, uh, whatever I can do yeah. putting my name on something to like 
get out there more. It's like, I'll, we'll put out a record and then we take them on tour and then usually it's on to the next thing for them, yeah. which I just love to watch happen. That's cool, man. Yeah. So and that's that's kind of what the, the label does, you know? It's like, I just want to yeah. put people on. What about your fanzines too? Like your poetry and your stuff you're, you're releasing? The yeah. downtime zine and words from a porch in October, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was doing a thing, especially with like the the month series, where I was I I put out a few books that were just like I wrote a poem every single day and then I put it out. You awesome. know what I'm saying? Uh, were you writing poetry as a kid or anything? I was interested in it. Yeah, I, did, I I excelled in English. I was horrible in math. Okay, one of those kind of kids. I don't know if you guys are the same way. Yeah, I fucking. I was so bad at math. If I you, hated math so much, man. If you put a handgun on this table and then a, <laughs> and, and a and a long division question. <laughs> <laughs> that was my worst subject math yeah 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 i'm I'm not living through that situation uh so, so english yeah yeah I, I excelled in english and i was always really interested in that and um and then also yeah just you know i think my love for music and stuff like leonard cohen and all those sorts of people yeah. made me you know when you look at leonard cohen where you're like he didn't put out his first record until he was in his 30s but he had this career of being a a, a novelist and a and a poet and and an incredible one at that. It was just it was inspiring, you know. That's awesome. So, we, can, yeah. we continue to do more of those. Yeah, I, not now because we're writing a record right now, and I, yeah. my brain can't. You know, I, I I liked using the poetry books as a way to keep my brain juices flowing and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So creative. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't know if you guys are like me. I don't. Therapeutic. I do not write unless I have to. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Have you? Do you write? Li- do you guys ever write lyrics before a song is written? Uh, no, I haven't. No, I did on the last album. You had you had time. a whole you had lyrics written before yeah. any music. Okay. Yeah. Was it hard for you to then attach it to a song? No, it was easier than I I could imagine in my head. Did you have to get rid of lines to make it fit? Sometimes. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's for what sure. that's what fucks me up. Right. It's being like, what if I really love everything and i have a hard time fitting it or i just try to make it fit yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) like this line's gotta be there somewhere yeah 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 Yeah. you can make it fit yeah yeah i've never done it but yeah i've never done that before until this last album where i was just writing lyrics and just kind of putting on a a board and then having in in certain areas you know the topics i wanted to write about and then if it if i thought of something then i would put it to that topic and just kept building it that way yeah until it was like filled and yeah. then once the music came along, I was like, ooh, this would go great. The feeling from the song will go perfect yeah. with this topic. Right. It was a weird concept of working that way, but it, it worked out really well. How early do you guys, do you decide on the theme of a record? Is that the cool? very beginning. Right really? Away? Yeah. yeah. Wow, ours is the very end after you read all the songs and wow, see the okay. vibe. Yeah, it's interesting. Interesting, yeah. So or there's one what, song that stands out or something. Yeah, it's like once you have that, then you're. Does that make it easier for you to then start chipping away? Because yeah. you're like, okay, how many different lanes can we take with this <laughs> exactly. topic? Yeah, yeah, it makes it a lot easier because if it's just open, then it's a little crazy because then we'll be all over the place. We kind of need this guidance, you know, a, a, f- a focal point. Totally. And so that mm. helps a lot when we have that. We notice that okay, then we can t- kind of not make it all over the place. <laughs> Um, but no, it I helps. get that. Six to the top. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, I do the very opposite. Yeah, the very end of the record. How many songs? And mm-hmm. yeah, and what the song? Be, what's the most inspirational? What we're talking about the subjects, mm. right? Yeah, I like that. I like that too. Yeah, yeah. It's usually like once you kind of get going, you're like, okay, what am I finding myself <laughs> writing about? Yeah, and then you're like, okay, I can build from there. Yeah, kind of a thing. Like, but that didn't start until, I mean, I guess I could point. I could. You know, hindsight is always fucking twenty twenty. Where you're like, okay, I was clearly fucking on that shit with that one. I was clearly on that shit with that one. Yeah, um, right. You know, where I, like our first record is called "To the Beat of a Dead Horse." Yeah, and I looked at that where I was like, okay, I could look at that and be like, I'm talking about problems that everybody else has, but I'm not doing anything to fix them. Mm-hmm. Ooh, okay. So, and all I'm doing is writing about it. Right. That's not helping. It's a great well, point. So it that could, I mean, it could be therapeutic. Inspiring. Right. Right. To some. Yeah. When, to- no, one thousand one thousand percent. I know what he's okay. saying though. Right. But yeah. where it's just like, yeah, like the work I'm doing is is expressing myself musically, but um there might need to be some more work that goes into this kind right. of a deal. Okay. So I'm not doing anything about it, but I'm beating a dead horse, whatever. So that's I see. So that's that's what that one is. And mm. parting the sea between brightness and me is about, you know, your usual fucking I'm on tour and I, you know, tour is do I feel more at home at tour on tour? Or do I feel more at home at home? Like one of those just, you know, mm. like my first mm-hmm. time really being away for 
long periods of time. A lot of a lot of I hate Los Angeles energy. <laughs> and then but then but then the realization of like, wait a minute. I miss it. I love yeah. it. I've been everywhere and this is yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah that you, happens. It you, the grass is always greener is always a thing, but then once you really start to take inventory, then you're like, oh wait. All my favorite food is here. All my favorite <laughs> movie theaters are here. All my like favorite record stores here. are here. All, yeah. Ocean, just everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like this made comforts. Me this place, the creature know. comforts. Yeah. I like the other song title after that. Um, is is survived by? Yeah, that's a cool song. That's a cool title of a record. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is survived by. And that was me turning thirty, mm. and thinking that that was a big deal as mm. someone who just recently turned forty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Where I was like, it's like it's really funny how much emphasis people put on thirty. Thirty is right. a big deal. Thirty is thirty is not a big deal. Not big at all. Yeah, but that was me reflecting on like, who am I? Like, what, what is, like, how, like, how am I going to be remembered? Like, am I living the way I should be? Like, right. all of those sorts of ideas. Um, and then stage four. Stage and this, four. And this all came at the end of once the music was done. You're saying? Or? Yeah. So usually we'll. I tr- we try to write a lot of music and then I start chipping away at it. I don't like writing lyrics until I have probably like five songs musically in front That's of smart. me. Yeah, same. Okay. So, I, so I can kind of listen to the different energies and be like, this song kind of feels like it could be more of a this song. This song mm-hmm. kind of feels like it could be more of a this song. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I start chipping away. But I think I had the 30 theme for, for a survive by cause I was like, this feels like a milestone and blah, yeah, blah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Sure. I was also had ho- horrible, horrible writer's block at that record. Okay. I, that was, that, that's when I mentioned earlier about fans having favorites or whatever. Yeah. That's the record that is my least favorite. But this Friday, shout out fucking remix remaster version come out this Friday. What's I know. That? I saw that. Uh, I saw that yeah. 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 So that, I mean, but it's funny, all the things I have wrong with, the, with that record, one of, the, one of them few things was how it ended up sounding and now it's uh, now it sounds fucking now that it's remixed and remastered i'm like it's like hearing the record for the first so time again in a way is, that's exciting this is really interesting because there's things that you like that you're listening to you're proving yes when it's out yes and you're like okay the mix is good it sounds great is it is it weird hearing it like a year later or something like oh man what was i thinking oh, so does I can, that happen to you yeah I mean, there's, we'll get into it. Man. There's also there's also a situation where how does that happen? Like you're so certain in the moment, like well, okay, this is you might be able, this might be your <laughs> moment of realization for you. We'll see. But <laughs> a thing that I'm thinking of with that record in particular, this is our first time going to like a big producer. Okay. So we were we were just so excited, but also maybe so much trust put in this situation mm. where just like, Oh, like we're good. Yes. This sounds fucking great. Like, yep. yeah. like it is what it is. And when you're in, also, when you're in a fucking room in the mixing room and you're hearing shit back, it's going to sound incredible. Sick, it's going to sound so incredible. Yeah, it's not compressed. It's all, right. Yeah. So then when you're start listening to mixes, like in your car and stuff like that, maybe, you're, maybe you're just afraid to speak up mm. if you're noticing things because you're like, Oh man, we're on a, you know, time is money. Like, yep. you know, like this is more money than any record we've ever, you know, it was a death uh, yep. wish record, but it was the most that they'd ever spent on a record at that point. Yep. So we are like, fuck man, like we got to just turn this thing in. Like it, th- it sounds good. It sounds good. And then all of a sudden down the line, I was like, man, I really don't hear that bass drum. Mm. Shit like that. Where I was like, fuck. And then we try to fix it in mastering, but it's like, it's too late at that yeah, point. Too late, so it was one of these things that just kind of always haunted me. Um, and then also I hear personally for myself yes. that I was not ready to record this record. I was writing lyrics still in the studio. I was unsure of, you know, all of those sorts of things. And, and, mm. and I hear the clunkiness in myself, mm. all of these sorts of things. And I learned to get over it. And now again, with the remix remastered version, like I can hear, I can take charm in it. I can see it as charming as opposed Mm to um, being ready. But that set us to be like, never again will we go into the studio (laughs) without every fucking line written. And without also another thing that our band is on is every single member of of the band has to like every single part in every one of these songs. Wow. Which is a very hard task. It's very hard. So we all have be on to the same page with it. All be on the same page with every single decision going forward. Damn. Is everything for for you, Morris, when you go in the studio? What do you mean? Written out, done. Before Usually before be, before the record, I'm yeah. thinking about the the major label one. Everything was always written in the studio or on tour. And, and then play those and songs and then live. When you go before. in to record with the producer, everything is done, ready to go. For the first one, two, three. For the first three records on Epitaph and Blackout, but then the Go record on MCA, we were writing in the studio. We just we had all this money and all this time in the studio as you were recording. How Songs were written, but I'm saying lyrics and stuff. Adding like working on lyrics and stuff. 
Oh, wow. Were you doing like, living at the Oak Oakwoods? Right. Were you, yeah, were you trying to do a collaborative thing, or were you just like behind schedule and you couldn't get it together? Um, yeah. And why was it different from the other times? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, I ended up not writing one lyric on the whole record of the Go record. That's right. That's right. You told me that. that that's like, like the that's, record that. That's a record I would love to revive, remix, and remaster with Chad Gilbert producing. Like he did nothing. Would you to like prove. to do the lyrics over? Uh, not necessarily, but. I was so I was almost checked out at the point where I've talked to this a hundred times in this podcast, but I didn't want to leave Epitaph Records. Me and Adam Blake were happy there. My brother really wanted to try and make a move, mm-hmm. and this guy Hans Hadelt was trying to sign us from the early parts of our career. What's he, his name? Hans Hadelt. Okay. He ended up signing Sheer Terra to MCA mm-hmm. when we didn't sign from Blackout. Long story short, he was there. We ended up doing the record with, with Matt Wallace, who produced the Replacements in Faith No More. A Todd Friend, our drummer, picked that dude. That was his dream mm-hmm. producer. And it was a lot of time and money. I was moving to California with my wife. I see. My head wasn't there. I wasn't really psyched on the, the sounds of the songs. Matt Wallace did a great fucking job. Mm-hmm. It's my fault for not being there more and paying attention to the production, the sound of it. But like I said, once I heard, I was like, dude, like tripling my vocals. Everything sounded so poppy and so overproduced and, and like candy coated. And I was just so bummed on it. So bummed on it to this day. I don't regret I know, it. I, I regret the fact that I should this. have been more involved in it. Right. Because I didn't I didn't end up not writing one thing on that record, man. Wow. So then when I wrote Nothing to Prove with Adam Blake and Chad, that that's my baby. That record right. for me is my fucking, my pride. Mm-hmm. Do you play any songs off of that record live? We do play a couple songs off that record live and they sound perfect with all the other songs. They, they fit yeah, into yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. They fit into the, our... our right. But yeah, this but some... I still get really cringed out even playing any of those songs. And this, wow. this, um, there's a bunch of songs on the record that people love. Justice sat here and told me that was his gateway to H2O. Right, My yeah. friend Luis loves it. Like all my different friends yeah. who I never expect, like that record they love or that was their first time hearing it. So I have to say, okay, just like there's some records <laughs> we don't love, other people connected. That's when they found you. Of course, you. Yeah. But for me, that's a really bad representation of, of what H2O means to me and what was supposed mm-hmm. to sound like. Mm-hmm. But if you see us live, we play Role Model or Memory Lane, which is really big in South America and Europe and everywhere else. The reaction's crazy. It's just right. like, but yeah, I mean, it's just damn. If I could redo that, I would redo it with Chad Gilbert. You know, right, I, the, right. you know, I love Chad's producing, and I don't know. I would like to remix it and release it. I've talked about that many times, but the fact he's doing it's kind of cool. Okay. And then hear the way you really wanted to sound it, like yeah, just like I don't know, take off the layers, and I don't yeah, know. No, I, I and I don't it. want Matt Wallace to think I'm dissing him because he's an right. incredible producer. He did his job. Yes, yes. Well, I didn't do my job. Right. Do you know what I mean? So I have to live uh. with that. But. It's a learning lesson. Though. Yeah, and people yeah. were like, when that came out, sellouts, all this fucking shit. Now people love that record. It was a yeah. time, it was message boards, all that. But now, throughout the years, people love, people love that record. But back <laughs> then, it was so sports. cool to hate a record or judge it by was on Fat or Epitaph. Yeah. Like, it, had to be, you know, it doesn't matter what labels. Like, yeah, it was a different time, dude. Okay. So that must feel nice to actually hear it and be able to listen to it awesome. the way you wanted to hear it. Yeah, and I mean, like, I think it speaks volumes when, you know, since... The record that came out after that came out like we didn't play a lot off of it live. Yeah, you know where it's you're, you're noticing as you're making set lists is little less every single yeah. tour, little less every yeah. single tour, mm. and also a lot of the songs didn't feel like they really worked live. Cause, right, cause, that's cause, another because that's because of me. Okay, because uh. I overcompensated by my by uh, by feeling so insecure about what I was doing that I overwrote. So I am fucking just gatling gun the entire time i like there's so few moments where there's just music happening on that record because i'm just i'm filling all of the space with stuff that i'm uncertain about Mm. um and i can hear that in my delivery um but again when you meet someone who says that's their favorite record no i just i say god bless that's why i stopped (laughs) it but that's why i stopped dissing i stopped talking about it right because it means something to someone else and also we yeah I str- I'm sure you feel this way. I strongly stand by once you put a song out of the world, it is not yours anymore. It's not. It's not. It's mm-hmm. it's up to whatever anyone else wants to attach themselves to. But I will say this year or last year when we did the 15 year, um, we did the thing where we the first night we played our, uh, s- we played our second and new our second and fifth record. Yeah. Uh, so we were like the fan favorite with the new record, you know, and we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, people just don't leave after we play the fan favorite. <laughs> But it was amazing. That's every, cool. every, the whole room was stayed the entire time. And I'm like, if there's this many people who are singing along to our second record, singing along to our fucking newest record, again, I can't think of anything better. Yeah. Uh, and then the next night we did our third record and our fourth record. And that was our first time playing the record we're talking about yeah. in full. Some of the songs we were like, man, this 
man, we have not played this song since 2013. Yeah. And to play it to an audience that wanted to fucking hear it and hear people sing those words back for the first time ever. That's cool. Was man. like chills. Yeah. Uh, like I was just like, it just in, the, in your brain, you're just like, what the fuck were you guys this whole time? That's, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Where were you back then? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I know. But, uh, I know. But, but that, yeah, this is me making, making a jest of like, the situation. I don't know if we did but, like a play on just that album when I played the full record front to back, which a lot of the songs have never been played live, to be right. honest. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Because we. What year was that? 2001. Yeah. Role Model was a single. You fucked we, up. You missed the 20 year. I know. Role Model was the single that we shot a video for, right? Memory Lane was a song they had us play on Conan O'Brien. Okay. Then the label wanted us to put Like a Prayer out, which was a secret track as a single. We said, no, we're not putting a fucking cover song out as one of our singles. Like, so when that never happened either. Right. And what happened was MCA or whatever universe, it all like just crumbled. Somehow it crumbled and we got off scot-free, just let go. And that never happens on a major label, dude. We were so fucking lucky. We had like a nine record deal or something, whatever yeah. stupid back yeah. then. Yeah, you wow. know what I mean. Doing, so like, yeah, I do. <laughs> and we we were, we were like with Newfound Glory and Blink and all these different artists on the same. It was just, it was a weird time, man. Yeah. That's not surprising that they wanted to push the cover because that was that was the tail end of bands breaking off covers. Alien yeah. Air Farm, Alien Air Farm, yeah, Orgy, Blue Monday, oh yeah, Marilyn yeah. Manson, Sweet Dreams, Faith. We had a Faith Limp Bizkit. That's a, a main song. You had a cover song? Yeah, which I was like, uh, which, which one album? What did, what did you do? We did a ministry cover. What song? Uh, what's that? Just One. Just One Fix? Yeah. Just One Fix. Okay. What so, album? Uh, it was, God. Was it? Like it three, <laughs> I'm like, what album? Was 11 that, albums ago. Was, was that like called the Kairos th- album. And, okay. uh, and that was like with a different drummer. And yeah, it was like in the middle phase. It was like a weird timing. But it ended up kind of working out well. I mean, we don't ever do that song live really maybe like yeah in a blue once in a blue moon yeah but uh yeah it was weird i was thinking like i don't know if we should have that as a cover <laughs> song you know yeah damn but, but it was cool yeah I'm, i i do want to actually remix a record now thinking about that man because I, I, I definitely do too i was thinking about it today before coming here and i was like man i i i, I just just curious how you guys felt about like if there was ever anything like that. And it's good to hear. Like, would you ever be? It's kind of weird. Like, no. I mean, we. we <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. Okay. Re-recorded. I'm not gonna say it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was just, we we re- recorded. We re-recorded. I was gonna ask you about that. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Because, but we're, f- we're fans. Like, what the hell are you doing? It was fine the way it was. There's always gonna be that, right? Which I'm fine with. Okay. And I, I like say, to guess what? You can still listen to that version. Yeah, right, and right. have fun with it. Yeah. That's fine, and I think there's a lot of charm in it. How mm-hmm. many years later did you re-record? Ten years. Wow. So it was for the ten year anniversary. I gotta do that. Shit. So, and the reason also was we couldn't remix and remaster it because it was recorded by our friend who never thought anyone outside of our friend group would ever hear it. So as soon as he was done, he was like, "Delete tracks." Like, wow. <laughs> <dude>. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like he didn't. Holy oh shit! So we literally have no possibility of ever wow. remixing. Remi- so we were like, "Well, oh God, guess what? Crazy. This gives us, you know, we lit." Don't and then when you when we re recorded it, we did it in a day and a half. Damn. It was like we know these songs. Yeah, they're they're so primitive. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like like compared to who we be, who we became. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's just like I know what you were gonna ask. I think. Let me hear what you're gonna ask. I was gonna say, would you ever re-record Sepultura records you didn't sing on? No. Okay, that was just my question. But we yeah. did re-record some songs that just happened to come out because of the pandemic, and we were doing it in a natural way, where it's like that's yeah. right. And so that was kind of cool, but in a way, we're like going in the studio and doing hooking everything up, I don't think so. No. Yeah. Did I, I don't know if I know? Did Max write all the lyrics? No. For that stuff. Okay, so I was gonna say, I mean, like that—that's where at least there's some wiggle room, you know. Right. If, if, totally. If, if that was an idea, mm-hmm. where it's like it's—it's it's not like you re-recording right. his work, you know. That's that's where it gets a little a because little it, clunky. It's a, it becomes very interesting, when, you know, especially coming from a, a fan's perspective, which I was before I got in the totally. band. So I didn't know how things were like going down or who was writing what. But I realize, you know, a lot of bands would make a band, you know, especially hardcore and coming from that punk scene is that everyone right playing together, yes. you know, in a studio or in a in, in your space, you know, and just creating things together. 
And that was something that was very special about the band, you know, before I joined, that everyone was writing together. Right. Like in a space. So that's what made it very special. Um, instead of just one person writing the whole album, right. or writing all the lyrics, you know, it was definitely a collaborative effort. Totally, yeah. totally. I love that. Yeah, me too. My brother did some lyrics too uh, with H2O2 as well. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's always a switch off with, with us as well. Um, as years went on, I, on the last album, I was just writing everything. But it was like, I definitely love to hear the input of ideas from other yeah. other people in the band. It's open to that, and I love that, you know, to put that in with the lyrics. Yeah. 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 Okay, I have a couple of questions, but I have to go pee, too, so I took one more oh pee break, my okay? good. This is awesome. Are you chilling? You good? Yeah. Like, do you, um, we're back in the podcast. Hi, guys. It was, it was our third, What's up? That was our third <laughs> piss break. So this year you have Outbreak Festival in Manchester in June, correct? Yes. And then March 15th and 16th, they're going to be in Australia. That's soon. Yeah. I love Australia. We just booked love our it. flights 21 hours. I'm oh, you, real did, sad. 21 hours. Wow. <laughs> yeah. How are you with traveling? Horrible. Yeah. Me too, man. I can't sleep on planes. Me either, man. Me either. I just go, I all do, right? I don't. You can't, you can't no, either? No. Just, I dread the travel, man. It's brutal, man. Yeah. You just going through the airport and stuff. I don't yeah, know. Me it's too. hard for me to get excited about a, an overseas tour. Yep. Because all I'm thinking about is, well... <laughs> I'm going to watch nine movies in a row. Yep. I'm going to feel like absolute dog shit. Because I'm not going to be sleeping on the flight. I am yep. not can't sleep on a flight. And I just look at my other band members who are just snoozing away. And I'm just so fucking resentful. Yeah, I'm so jealous. <laughs> so resentful. Um, my band's popping pills, going to sleep. I'm like, wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd sleep. Th- I would never do that shit. Dude, I'd be yeah. so scared to even do anything like I t- that. I took, uh, I, t- I took, um, what's one of the heavy ones? Uh, um, what, um, not um, Lunesta, but I don't know. I know the name. I know, one, I know it's right there. Anyway. The ones that like, um, what's it called? It's bad. People get addicted to them. It's like I was just thinking of like a hot toddy or something. Oh like no, 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 no! What's a hot toddy? I'm fucking straight edge, bro. What's a hot toddy? Is that a drink? Drink. <laughs> <laughs> Ambien. Ambien. Oh my! That's God. no joke, man. Yeah, People I, go to rehab for that. I took. I took. <laughs> for an, real. I took an Ambien because I was like, I need to fucking sleep, you know, whatever, and it just made me nauseous. I was like, now this is so much worse. Now so you never fell asleep on it. I never it. fell asleep. I just, felt, I just felt terrible. Not even like gummies or something? I don't know. He's straight edge, bro. Oh, sorry. sorry. Don't, don't disrespect. So, All right, I'm sorry. Me- melatonin does not work for me. Okay. It just, it just gives me a headache. Mm-hmm. Um, Advil PM can work for me, but you don't want to take that every day because it's bad for your liver and shit. Yeah. You know? sure. NyQuil. NyQuil. Fucking straight edge, bro. Uh, they oh yeah, that's Z- alcohol. Zequil, but Z-Quil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Zequil is like the non-alcoholic okay. version of it. But <laughs> it's, What's it's, a toddy? Yeah, hot toddy is like what an is, alcoholic drink. No, with, I don't fuck with that, bro. Okay, um, I'm sorry. I um, totally. Yeah. Do you not? Do you? If you're sick, do you not? <laughs> take, do you not take Nyquil? No, no. He, he can't. Man, I was a little kid. That, I mean, I was, I was thinking like it's not. There's alcohol in it. Yeah. Yeah, but that's since I was a kid, probably took it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm a weirdo, bro. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say like I still consider myself straight edge, but like, but like I'm not. I'm right. not taking Nyquil to like get fucked up. I'm taking. Of course Nyqu- you're not. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what I take. I, I take. Too, I take Advil and Tylenol if I have to. Yeah. Do you want to mm-hmm. hear the funniest thing my <laughs> my my late mom ever said to me? Yes. Um, Rest in peace to your mom. I appreciate that. Uh, so she made us go to church and shit, mm-hmm. right? Same. I, I, I can. You can relate yeah, to this. Yeah, oh yeah, my mom. So once I got once I became straight edge, like, and I'd have to take communion. They always had like the on the side, uh, on the side of the of the of the tray, there was like juice. Yeah. And then there, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. The so one. she so she noticed that I took the juice, and she <laughs> sat down. And the funniest thing my mom ever said to me, very angrily, she goes, "You don't have to be straight edge for Jesus." <laughs> <laughs> That's a- that's incredible. I, oh I fucking that's incredible I, fucking quote. How, I howled out loud in church. <laughs> I was like <laughs> oh, oh, that's the best. I was line. like I was like it's it's such a funny thing to be mad at your son for. Like oh. like you're mad at, like like we oh, this is shit is all make believe whether right. it has oh. alcohol or not. It's all make believe. Oh so Ian's just, my god. Like man, we never <laughs> had at our church like alcohol. Like Oh, I did too. It was a kid. Never. Yeah. It, it was, was always grape juice. It was wine. It was yeah. like, here's the body of Christ. Ours was like, what's the juice. body of Christ? Is it rice cake or something? It's like rice something? Uh, at ours, it was like a, a little wafer. Yeah, yeah, a wafer. Yeah, a wafer. Yeah. It was a wafer. God, yeah. I hate it. Remember my, my mom made go to church. We didn't I have wafers, it. but for some reason, it was like the blood of Christ was going on, but it was always like juice. So I was like, oh, I can't wait to drink <laughs> the blood of Christ. Fucking straight edge for Jesus. <laughs> Welch's. Welch's. That's a t-shirt, man. Blood of Christ coming up. Straight edge. So you've been straight your whole life. 
Yeah. Never tried nothing. Never tried Just nothing. Just like me. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. Not even a 40 ounce. Yeah. Like nah, bro. Nothing. Here's, I'm not talking about you. I'm, he said he didn't do it. <laughs> Here, here's, here's where you and I might have a fun fundamental disagreement. About. Okay. You ready? Oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm only still straight edge because I'm, I'm too lazy. <laughs> to try I something? Know. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I just got into jazz, man. You think you think I have the fucking capacity to like figure out what weed I like? Like that shit. There's so it's so fucking. There's too now, much yeah. shit. Yeah. And yeah. also, I don't want to deal with like my friends who are like all the guys who are like big weed guys, like trying to feel like they need to coach me into some shit. <laughs> I, I, it's like I, it's yeah. it's embarrassing. Also, like a forty year old who breaks edge and then like yeah, has to figure out how to dr- like it's yeah. It's, You're right. You're right. It's, it's exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting to think about. And like also, I don't want to like deal with having to like explain to people like yeah i guess i like the yeah, idea good point. I, I always sort of yeah. said like That's an interesting point yeah. i always sort of said like i could see myself at some point i'm already now 40 so i don't know what it's gonna if it'll happen i can see myself at some point <laughs> having a nice glass of wine with a with a dinner right okay all right it doesn't all sound right. like I, like sounds like a fucking everyday life kind of thing mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying i'm not doing it to party i'm not doing it whatever yeah but also at the same time you know how much money i fucking save not having to buy drinks when i go out to dinner yeah all that sort of shit yeah, anyway. especially now drinks. I guess are. Expensive. Are you curious about it still to try something? I've never been curious. Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying. Like it's like, sh- do I feel like I have missed out on a part of my life because of certain things? I kind of do. Okay, I kind of do. Okay, you have. Friends. I can tell you no. Sure. <laughs> such <laughs> as what? It's like such as what you think? Um, would it have probably been a really fun experience to like fucking do shrooms with yeah, friends yeah, out yeah. in the desert and okay, like okay you have, got a good point well, you know what i'm saying yeah. shit shit like that okay. i'm not interested in like doing blow and being like yeah that like, <laughs> like, like doing an eight ball and yeah. hanging out with the boys <laughs> like, like, that would be crazy yeah, yeah and, that and, would be a little extreme any friend that i've ever been around that's on coke has solidified like yeah, yeah i've never looked like that and that's scary chill. you know yeah. Yeah. i know my friends I, I scary, also, good, it's not a good look and the black the blackout drunk is one of my least favorite things to ever have to be around when you when someone Scary. is talking to you with the face of uh, uh what do i call it uh kiss punch or puke i'm like you're either gonna kiss me you're gonna punch me or you're gonna puke on me and i'm not interested in any of those things right now <laughs> uh so like that stresses me out seeing someone in that state yeah the, Very the, good the, point. the vacant stare stares yes. scares the shit scary out of me. Yeah, it man. scares the shit out of that. me and Do you have a lot of friends that are still straight edge you hang out with or no, <laughs> me either. No, no. he's my brother. He's not straight edge. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. yeah, I never hung out with only straight edge people. My whole, I've never no. been like that, man. I, I hung out with savages in New York, drinking forties. Yeah, they blunts, were savages. cocaine. Yeah, yeah. fist yeah. fights. Like, yeah. and I was I also, just a straight edge guy there. I also never cared when a friend broke edge. I don't care. Yeah, I, don't, I never cared. Yeah, it's, never it's cared, not dude. my business. It's your business. Shout out um, to our brother Luis. I was happy when he he stopped straight up. <laughs> I, I some, t- some people's lives improve. I, I always oh, tell absolutely. him that. I'm, I was happy that Luis yeah. did that. Shout out to Luis, by the way, made this yeah. happen, connected this. But yeah, Luis, when he started, I was like, dude. I was like, 99 percent of people who have stopped their lives have improved. I've yeah. I've noticed. Yeah, you know, with friends that was like, I'm not doing this anymore, and I'm like, I'm telling my friend to stop being straight as and went to weed. I was happy. For oh, him. I was happy. Okay, for him. okay. there's there's Venn diagrams. Like right. Only you know a couple saying? people in my yeah. life. He's one of them. But yeah, like, mm. or people just quit when they get older. Or I'm sure kid, if you ask member of my band, members of my band, like, yo, do you think Jeremy would would benefit from weed? They'd be like, fuck yeah, that guy would benefit <laughs> from weed. <laughs> are you a stress case? Yes. Uh, yeah. Are you okay. aware? Are you? Are you are I also you, can't sleep. I was gonna ask you, do you sleep at home? No. Mm. No. Are you married? No. You have a lady? I'm, yeah. Is yeah, she, is she yeah, straight yeah. edge? No. Neither is my wife. No. Yeah. No. Um, I drive my wife to drink and, for sure. And she and she takes <laughs> she she takes edibles to sleep every night or like you know like my gummy, wife tried that gummies too. and that's how it sounds. And yeah. she, she's and out. She, she sleeps so. Like, I just yeah. I just stare at her. I know it's. <laughs> What's that like? He's like, right, motherfucker. But, but yeah. I'm not. But but see, this is where I get funny. Where I'm like, but I could have this. Yeah. But because of something that I chose to do at fucking fourteen years old. I feel thirteen like, for me, yeah. You know, saying like, like exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it's sometimes I. I you g- feel like you wouldn't be you if you weren't. I think there's a part of that identity, but I don't think anyone also connects me to straight edge. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I haven't made it like a part, like really my identity. I think. Yeah. Uh-huh. I think people. I've talked about it in maybe enough that people might assume so, but like no one in my band is. Um, Neither my band yeah. never was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People like, thought we were straight edge band. It's like, nah, dude. Yeah. Well, I definitely think you're you're not missing out on too much, honestly. 
Other than just like knowing what it is, but also like right. that's I'm fine. What it feels I'm like, also fine. Yeah. I can tell you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you guys aren't missing out on too yeah. much. It's you ever tried a, coke too? Uh, I have. Yes, it's it's definitely something I was like I want to try, and uh, I know that it's not for me. Mm-hmm. Like you said, I don't like pe- to be around people that are on it, and I don't like how I get it scared changes my friends around it. The personality to become the worst person that they are mm. it brings out the oh. worst part of a person's personality right. i think yeah and it, and i don't like to be around it and also i i don't like to be around since i stopped drinking the same people are really shit-faced like it really drives me crazy and and, and it's like wow i never noticed this before when i was drinking yeah you know you like it's, that. A, it's like extremely i don't know on the edging like it can see people but people turning you know, and it's like, oh, they're they're becoming something that's out of their character, and and I don't. Yeah, yeah. I look at my son, and I'm like, dude, he's never tried anything, just like me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, he doesn't need anything, right? Because he's obsessed with skateboarding, obsessed with drumming, surfing, women. Yeah, like that's his thing. Yeah, I see. This. And he's turning yeah. 21 next week. He's like, don't people usually sell out straight edge at 21? <laughs> I'm like, sometimes. <laughs> he's like, I'm getting three X's. I was like, bet that's really cool. Like. That's awesome. That's on you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. Your, that's, your, that's your next yeah. hat. Cool. Yeah. But I can't see him on anything. All of his I mean, friends are all vaping. They're doing yeah, all these yeah. things. He's Those just friends. so high. He's like me. He's just so high on life. Like just very yeah. hyperactive. I've been like that my whole life. Yeah. yeah. I love I really, that. I'm yeah. scared. I, would be, I was so scared to try shit because of my brothers, you know, but. Yeah. That that totally makes sense. Just happened around my around my house. Um, What about social media? You on social media a lot? Do you check your DMs? You, do you respond uh, to I, a negative, I, a negative comments? Do you respond to shit or? I tr- you know. Because you were checking some reviews, we know that. Yeah, I I am unfortunately on social media. If I didn't have to it's be... It's necessary for if promoting. If I didn't have to be, I wouldn't... I would like to hope that I wouldn't be. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't make me feel good, ever, <laughs> you know? Pain dives. Yeah. Pain. Pa- yeah. That's going, my takeaway today, pain, pain dives. Or pain mining. Pain mining. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But do you check DMs? Do you like... I don't really get to, to be honest. Like I, I don't. Do you really have any get, negative comments or shit like that? No, not really. No, I mean, um, I, we keep our head to the ground. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like we, we, we just work and tour and put out fucking music and whatever. Like we don't. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. Like and then like there's no social media. Over these past couple of years too, like I do, I post less and less like kind of personal stuff. I just kind of like to post what i'm promoting and yeah, that's also like or just like put people on me like yo this is what i'm listening to or i like, see you do that yeah 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 like that's that's more interesting to me than like you making a fucking four thing paragraph about something that you know it's like is this is this for me or is this for somebody else you and you've been there with that thing back going back to alternative press yeah. and the conversation online like yeah all that stuff is yeah, like, I'm, too, I'm too old i don't i don't i don't need any of that you know like there's you try to you try to surround yourself with enough people to get if you're seeking validation try to s- surround yourself with enough people that love you to get that from them as yeah. opposed to strangers right. yeah, that's a great yeah. that's a Absolutely. great one yeah we um, got that but yeah. that's but you know it's it's one thing to say that into a microphone in front of two people that <laughs> that can relate to it but it's another thing to actually accomplish it you know what I'm saying? no it's hard it's, it's, in the, it's, it's hard it's hard not to be yeah. honest like when you when all of a sudden you see a live photo of yourself and you're like, damn, I look kind of cool. Maybe I'll repost that. And then you do that, and then I don't feel good about doing that. I do that, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I felt, I, f- I know I like quote unquote look cool in this, and like my friends are gonna heart it or whatever the fuck. But like, <laughs> but like, but like, I'm now thinking about how for 24 hours this photo of me like kind of looking cool is like sitting in my story, and like, what am I getting from that? I'm yeah, not, I'm not like I don't. I'm you're supporting wh- the photographer. That's a big thing to me, honestly, too. Same, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Support so, the photographers; they don't really sure. get much love. You know they what I mean? Really yeah. appreciate that too. Yeah. So, are you, so you have any like daily rituals? I know you're a coffee guy. I'm a coffee guy. I'm a Peloton guy. Ooh, okay, yeah, right. respect. Because of the that was the pandemic. It was, but, yeah. At least, I, at least you're still riding. A lot of people get rid of those. Supposedly after the pandemic, like true, yeah, I heard like that. A downfall yeah. with it, but yeah. yeah, you're on that. That's cool. Yeah, it's. I don't. So you exercise? I do. I, I was doing like the why for a while and then pandemic happened. I was like, I got to do something because, you know, I, it's, it's just cardio. I don't yeah. really do like the actual workout classes and stuff. Um, <laughs> I, remember, <laughs> I remember years ago we, before we went out with, um, uh, was it with turn? Yeah. It was before we went out with turnstile. Um, 
Justice had just moved to LA and he and I just became friends. And him and Luis and whatever, they're like, they're like, yo, man, we want to get you fucking ripped. They're like, they're like, we want you to like show up day one of that turnstile tour and like flex on D Fang. <laughs> He's like, jacked, man. Yeah, Daniel Fang is jacked. Was, and especially at that time too. I was just like, I was like, I love the idea. And, so I, and, and I love that you guys are looking at me like I'm a fucking gerbil that you guys want to like turn into this thing. Like uh I was, but for me, I just try to focus on cardio just so i don't Good. lose that on stage yeah you man. know like yeah i don't when i'm doing the classes too i have them on mute and i just listen to podcasts i just kind of go at my own thing but at least so i can track the stats after of like what yeah, i did yeah. but I, I vaguely follow but like i don't really do the like i'm not in, invested in like the, yeah the person mm-hmm. i'm watching how many coffees today coffees because you said you have one like midday almost coming here yeah while well, i also sleep late ah okay so you're a night owl i am a night owl. well you don't sleep at all actually so you know, so i go to be- i like I three, I four? eventually go to sleep around probably like two thirty three. Okay, and then I'm up at like ten. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about you? Uh, You're you strike me as like I'm a fucking I'm up with the sun. You strike I'm me not, as I'm not. I'm not. I'm not one of those yet. <laughs> a lot of my friends are like wake up in the morning, go to the fun six in the morning. Now my wife stays up incredibly late doing puzzles every freaking night. Moon does till like yeah, two or yeah, three in the morning. Yeah. You know I'm I'm in bed before midnight. Try to be and I wake up like eight. I'm not like seven in the morning, go to the gym, four in the morning, Marky, Marky Mark type. Mark Wahlberg goes to the gym at 4 a.m. Yeah, at 4 a.m. club. I watch his clips. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, in the gym, like, nah, dude. I'm not what really a morning is, person. What time is Mark Wahlberg going to bed? I don't know. Bro, dude. I don't know. He sleeps that often. It looks like, I mean, I follow him too, and he's, it seems like he's up all the time. Bro. It's in like the gym four at 4 a.m. with his boys, morning. like, working out, yeah. like, Let's get a 4 a.m. club. Yeah, he's got all his boys that's like, early, around man. him, like, that's, early. 7 a.m. is early to me to work out. That's, dictating that's, the workout for like a bunch of people or that have changed. He looks. He looks. They, his friends look ripped. The older dude. Yeah, the older dude. I was like, dude, that dude's like sixty and ripped. It's I don't not, know how they do it, man. It's not a happy life. Yeah, that's some weird. Hol- <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's some Illuminati. And I'm just yeah. kidding. Um, but yeah, I'm not really a super morning person. But I'm up before my family. I'm in bed before my family. But we we watch movies and do all that stuff. But I do sleep good. I try to at least get eight hours. I try. It's important too. Extremely. Especially important. when you get older, I think. Yeah. What, yeah. So you don't you get like four or five hours? I try to get it. I try to get at least six and a half. That's great. Yeah, that's that's I great. Try, yeah, I try. Six, I do my best, dude. You sleep, know? sleep, sleep is everything. Yeah, without it is. sleep, your immune system just everything. Sleep's the most important thing. Yeah, sleep and water, is. obviously, but like yeah, just for your immune system and shit, you know. Totally. Man. Yeah. What about warm? Should you do warm ups on tour? Work warm ups? No. You ever lose your voice? My talking voice. I'll yeah, lose, I'll lose my talking voice, but we I just talked st- about this. But I can still yell. Yeah, I try to talk to my wife about it. This is the talking voice and the singing voice is two different things. Yeah, you can sound sound totally hoarse, and your band's like, "Oh my god, don't talk all day." And then when you sing, it comes from a different place. Yeah, that's such a. I love talking true. about that because people don't understand that where you, you're singing and talking from. Mm-hmm. But I just like won't talk for a whole day. Yeah, write notes to my band. I'm trying to save my voice. That's the best thing to do is not talk. Right. People, so how I'm talking? Like obviously, I have a raspy. Interesting, weird sounding voice. It's cool. It's, I like your voice. Cool. Thank you. You can do animation. Yeah. <laughs> I can hear a character it's, there for sure. Uh, people <laughs> have this idea that I sound like this because of singing, and it's not. I've just always sounded like this. So when I'm on tour, it's you can imagine it's not much. It's 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 worse than this. So uh, so that's tough, um, and it's also tough because that's usually when we have to do press and I have to do fucking interviews. And, yeah. And like oh, on video yeah. shit, and I'm just like a wreck. So, you know it. So it, you're not warming up at all. It hurts my feelings a bit when people like are just like, man, fucking Jeremy does not know how to fucking sing and stuff. I'm just like, it's you just happen to be catching me at the worst time to be interviewed on shit. Um, <laughs> anyway, you know, I tried doing warm ups. You know, early on, I tried doing the fucking. I'm not gonna drink coffee. I'm not gonna. I'm mm, gonna do all. Of, I'm gonna do all mm. of these things that are supposed to supposedly supposed to help you. And uh, nothing changes. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like no, I'm still able to project and I'm still able to yell. Yeah. I'm still able to do my job, right? Yeah. I try to rest as much as possible. Um, obviously, if a day off is around, I'm fucking psyched. Yeah. You know, whatever. Love um, days off. Oh, yeah. But uh, a great story that I love, Brad Wood, who was mentioned earlier, he's who produced his Survive By in Stage 4. He's done a lot of great stuff. Liz Fair, Far, Smashing Pumpkins, all sorts of amazing records. Um he did the first two Sunday Day Real Estate records as well. He recorded Diary, and those guys were like just out of high school, really wow, young, okay. right? Um, I don't know if you're f- very familiar with that record. No. Um, it's a beautiful, it's an incredible record. His voice is incredible, right? He tells this great story where uh, all the demos are great, 
it's a sub pop record. He shows up, you know, Sunday Day Real Estate comes out to Chicago to do the record, and Jeremy Enoch cannot sing. And Brad Wood is like, "What happened? What's going on? Talk to me. Like, what? Like, yeah. What? What if? What have you changed?" He's like, "Well, I wanted to be prepared for the record, so I stopped smoking. I stopped drinking. Co- stopped drinking coffee. I, you know, I'm trying to whatever. I'm drinking a lot of water." And uh, he's like, "What's been the major change?" And he's like, "That I stopped smoking." And he's like, "Let's go get you a carton." Wow. And literally God. went, got him cigarettes, voice came right back. Damn. So it's literally whatever your body is yeah. used to. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. yo, I watched fucking Rick Rodney from goddamn Strife with a two liter of Coke on stage as his drink. <laughs> it's crazy. It's really? disgusting. It's, Damn. I can't think about, think about yeah. Lemmy. Lemmy could perform and do all I the know. stuff he put in his body. It's true. I Dickie, know a Barrett, lot. Dickie Barrett's voice. So many smoking. vocalists have different routines and i i can't understand a lot of them it works for people yeah whatever works whatever yeah. whatever different. you have found i mean like works I, for you i've i've been told that wine is very dehydrating you Extremely. look dude fucking peter Steele took down like four on stage a night the singer of the national takes down like two on you stage you see pete steel from typo yeah yes he did yeah. he was wow. he, he His like voice was sick. chugged wine rest I in mean, peace so. Singer Death Angel, it's like a lot of gin. Like it'll be like a bottle, you know. I'm like, how is that? And his projection is ridiculous. That's what I'm saying. It's, Some it's people, unbelievable. Man. I don't know how it can happen, but not with me. So no way. Dave Grohl drinks on stage too, right? I don't know. I copied Dave Grohl because he chews bubble gum. He chews and, gum the whole time, and that's time. what yeah. I've been doing for like yeah. a long time on yeah. stage, trying to keep my. I like it. I don't know. I'd be so afraid to swallow yeah, that shit. I, I have swallowed it. it. I have a spit in the crowd. I have a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a voice thing that I'll 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 reveal to you guys off mic. Okay. Okay. It's a, it's, okay. it's a it's a thing. It's a secret voice thing. It's that's literally why my label is called that. Okay. It's All an right. inside joke with friends. Ah. It's an inside comment with friends. Okay. okay. Do you have okay. any ma- you have any major regrets in your life? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do two questions you're optimist or pessimist or major regrets these are your two questions uh wow so i have to answer, answer both of those yeah, yeah whatever you want um, whatever order you want of course everybody has regrets i mean yeah. yeah i mean i if we want to get heavy i mean i wrote an entire record about my mom passing and a big part of that was my handling her sickness by uh not being home that is heavy and that must have been hard to write and very therapeutic at the same time. Yes, it was the easiest record I've ever written, and also the hardest record I've ever written. Yeah, the easiest record because there was a plethora of stuff to write about. Right. There was never not a lane that I could go down. You know, it was yeah. like it's like, oh, do I want to write a song about when she was on her way out, and I w- could have been having valuable conversations with her, but no, I chose to go hang out with my friends, or I yeah. chose to, you know, all sorts of stuff. You know, I yeah. like to think I know I was loved, and I and she knows she knows that I loved her, all of that, but. Could I have been more present? Absolutely. She passed away while we were on stage, uh, and wow, in man. in Gainesville, Florida. Yo, so wow. like I got, I came off stage to the text from my brother being like, "You need to give me a call," and I was like, I immediately knew what it was. Was she in the hospital at that time? She was in hospice. Hospice. Yeah. And and I had just gotten home from, uh, we had just done Japan and Korea, um, and I got home and she was she had been in hospice care and I visited her and she seemed like she was doing okay and then it was. Then I was like, okay, I, you, we're going to go play this festival in Gainesville. It was the fest. Where I was like, we're yeah. gonna, we'll go play the fest. Uh, I'll see you on Monday. She was like, okay. And then she went to a doctor's visit the next day, got sick while at the doctor's office. Like her body just started to shut down. They took her to ER. My brother called me. We were playing the next day. And Chris is, my brother Chris, he's like, he's like, it's, it's pretty bad. I was like, do you think I need to come home? And he was like, it wouldn't hurt. And I was like, but my brain is like, my whole band flew out here. Yeah. If we don't play this thing, we're gonna lose a bunch of money. Yeah. You know, I'm. I, you start making excuses for all the reasons to not go home. Yeah. When it went in my heart, I probably knew that I was just afraid to face that. Yeah. And then I also convinced myself she would want me to stay because mm-hmm. that's the kind of mom she was. She yeah. Was very, she was very just like, don't worry about me. Like you got, you know, I'm so proud of you. You go do I was your say thing. She's super proud of you. Yeah. That kind of a thing. So I was like, she would want me to stay, so I'll stay. So we did played came back to that text and then it was just like the worst wow so there's a lot of stuff there yeah you know what for I'm sure saying? yeah that, like yeah like that's that's kind of the first thing that my brain probably goes to yeah you know? for sure man um that makes me want to call my mom to be honest she's right. never seen my mom in a minute you know what yeah. i mean like she's going through a little bit and she's yeah. not that far and i should she's getting older and despite whatever whatever relationship we have throughout True. our lives she's still my mom yeah absolutely i know i have like um What's it called? The word, not uh, what's the word? Towards her resentment. Resentment. Yeah, yeah and I talk about it in therapy and stuff like that. And but yeah, I love you, mom. Um, There's, I mean, 
the you know any advice I give to any friends who still have living parents is like think of the shit that you would yeah. never ask your parent, never think to ask your parents. Ask them just for sure. Like I, just, my dad's still around, and you guys, uh, do you guys close? We are not not close. Yeah, yeah he yeah. was. We I never lived with him. Like yeah. he, I, my parents got separated while my mom was pregnant with me. Yeah, and he was always supportive, and I'd see him on Wednesdays. You know, kind of kind of a deal. Um, nice guy. Nice guy I'll ever meet, but yeah. you know, just can't say I learned anything from him, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but he's, he was always pleasant. Hardcore um, taught you more. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Same. So, Dude. uh, thank you, Kevin seconds. So anyway, like we recently, I, we just did a listener mailbag episode where okay. I just, it was just answering questions that were, All right, sorry, I do that yeah, too. Yeah, yep. right. And my co-host who's my editor. He was like, can I ask you a question before we get to the listener questions? I was like, yeah, for sure. And he's like, why are you named Jeremy? I've never thought about that in my life. I've never, it's, it's such an obvious thing that people probably know their yeah. stories. I've never, I never thought to ask. That's so it. I literally called my dad and he didn't answer. Uh, <laughs> but then, but then, I but then, but yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Uh, but then I, when he did, when I did get on the phone with him, I recorded it and we put it at, we put it at the end of the episode just cause it'd be kind of fun. I was like, Oh, right. that's cool. And, man. and let me tell you the story. Not good. <laughs> you want to know the story? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my coworker named his kid Jeremy with that was a neat name. Oh my god! It's like dude. that's it. That's literally it. Just that you 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 just stole the name idea from your coworker. That's it. That's my legacy. <laughs> fucking fucking uncreative ass parents. <laughs> oh, <holy shit. laughs> so so anyway, are you named after anybody, Derek, or no? Yeah, it's kind of funny. <laughs> what are you named after? I mean, it's not directly the same name, but I remember that my I asked my mom. I was like, "Yeah, well, like, where did Derek come from?" Because I looked it up, and it's like a 16th century like hangman, and uh, it's also the the well tower for oils are called the Derek. Oh, Derek, yeah, yeah. Jeez. And I was like, and she was like, "No, it's definitely not from any of those things." But. Uh, <laughs> But she was like, I really love that show Bewitched. And there's the character Darren. That's right. Oh. And Darren. And then she was like, yeah. I thought Derek from Darren. Oh, Darren. Remember yeah. Darren Bewitched. Yeah. Her husband. Yeah. And it, it came from kind of like that transformation to Derek. Damn. Wow. Yeah. I've never. What about you? Do you I know? never even asked my mom, man. You don't yeah. know either. I know. It's just Tracy Todd Toby. Three T's. That's all I know, wow. man. Wow. You should ask. Tracy Todd. My dad's name was Stacy. But they named my oldest. Tracy, yeah, and then Todd, Toby. Maybe just want to have three. T- we always have the three teeth. I don't know. We all have tattoos of these three daggers with a heart with mom. We all have me and my that's brothers with three T T's. Yeah, that's cool. That's a good question. It's, it's funny though, right? Like, yeah. so, like it's things like that. Like, I, we, there's a song on my record called uh, "Palm Dreams," which I wrote about. I never knew why my mom came to California. She's from Nebraska. Mm. Oh wow! And and I when having to go through the thing that I would not put on my worst enemy, which is having to go through your parents' stuff when in the matter of cleaning yeah. out a house and, and deciding what's worth throwing away and what's That's worth keeping. It's, it's we wouldn't put it on my worst enemy. Okay. And through that I read letters and I and I and I found stuff oh, that I was like that kinda was gave me a little bit of an insight. But it was like, you know, a thing that I repeat in the song is like, what was it that brought you west? And it's just like I never thought to ask. You know, yeah. like I so anyway Ask more questions. Ask more yeah, questions. Yeah, ask yeah, ask yeah, your absolutely. parents. Even I the most agree. mundane shit. Yeah. I know because, yeah. You're totally right. Because we've had, I've had my brother on here tell stories about my dad and my mom tell a totally different story about my dad on here and both their memories are different of absolutely, my dad yeah. before he <laughs> I was going to say this, yeah. Like when, did your, when did your father sister, pass? Yeah. He died when I was three. Three. And yeah. I have two other brothers and my mom is raising three boys and we've had all these conversations, emotional conversations on here. My first episode was my mom. She was crying and talking about my mom, mm-hmm. about my dad. And just like the different... We block out different things in our childhoods or whatever we, about your True. situations growing up. And I feel like it, all the stories don't match a lot of the times, you know? Right. And but I that, but, the, but that person ends up being a more complicated person than you, you can imagine. They have different sides. They're human, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You start to realize your parents aren't, you know? Oh, my God. That's yeah. that's the truth. I think that's the moment you become an you know, adult is when yeah. you realize you're like, oh, my parents are uh, flawed people as yeah, well. You know right. what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and then you become a parent, and then you're like, "Fuck." Yeah. Am I, am I like that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Then you, for me, it's just like, right? Yeah. Like I never want to be like that. I want to be different to my son and be, right. you know, more open and loving and. 
compassion and conversations and all that stuff, which I've definitely pulled off. Me and my wife, for sure, very lucky with my son. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That relationship that I didn't have such an open relationship with my mom talking about things. Like we talk about everything in this house. Yeah, you know that. I've, you know I've what I mean? So it's, yeah. But that's really cool. I got that vibe immediately when you were talking to your son. Yeah, <laughs> just we talk about everything too yeah. much. Now it's just like I don't want to hear anything else. But yeah. yeah, but yeah, I'm very, very lucky. He's a very good kid, and yeah. What about optimist pessimist? <laughs> I'm a pessimist for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, I I wouldn't even try really? to try to make a I comment. I don't get the vibe from you at all. It's interesting. I, th- you Your know, whole life probably. I like to. <laughs> I would like to t- convince myself that I'm more of a uh, of an optimist, but I think the people closest to me would laugh and be like, "All right, all right, man." Um, <laughs> but you know, I I think I try to see the positives in situations, yeah. so I I make the effort to be a pessimist. But in my core, you make the effort. <laughs> I, it, but in my core, I'm thinking of all of the fallout or all of the worst case scenarios, and I think I think having the foresight of forward thought about like what a worst case scenario could be helps get a thing across the finish line a lot because I, I'm, I'm, I'm already thinking about what could all go wrong in a scenario, whether it's like with releasing a record, whether it's yeah. like with, with, with a tour, you know, like going into a tour when post COVID being like, okay, like if we, if someone gets sick, how are we going to yeah. navigate that? You know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm going into it thinking, Someone's gonna get sick on this tour, so how are we gonna deal with that going forward? You know, yeah, like which that, is a reality. Yeah, it's, it's not, that's not that's not. That's just negative. one example of like how my brain would work, where it's just like yeah. where it's like okay, what if you know back in the fucking mid two you know two thousand ten, it was like what if our fucking record leaks before or whatever dumb shit like that. Yeah. You know, like how are we gonna use that to whatever? Um, but yeah, I I try to be more pos. I you know what it is. <laughs> I keep I, I'm better at bottling up the pessimism and just letting it rot my brain, and mm. then outwardly trying to pretend I'm a pessimist. I mean, I'm an optimist. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I I like to self rot with it. <laughs> but you, I mean, I feel like I don't know. That's good vibe. You yeah. I don't know. You seem you always smile. You have a good smile. You seem like you're every time I see you, you're like. I can't help but smile on stage. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I'm yeah. writing the saddest fucking songs you've ever heard in your yeah. life or whatever. But like when someone is yelling the words back, like I can't hide that that's not the best feeling in the entire world. Yeah, man. You know, I don't, I'm not, I don't, when I find myself, um, not appreciating playing on stage, I get real down on myself. I get real mad mm-hmm. at myself. Cause I, I said, early I've been there on, too. I said early on where I was like, the second this feels like a job, I'm out. Yeah. And I didn't stand by that. Cause there's times where it does feel like a job. Same. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And, yeah. and those moments, especially post pandemic. Oh yeah. Were moments where I was like, give me the worst set of my life. It's something to do. It's I'll something, to, it. it's yeah. performing. It's, it's something that I missed so much. And like, not that we took it for granted, but I feel like when we, everything stopped, I was like, fuck, like this is the first time I'm not going to Europe in like 20 years, a yeah. summer tour, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. Like just so when everything stopped me, like I do appreciate my life and I'm, everybody's healthy with my family. And but yeah, but like not doing that thing that we you've been doing, and having that connection with humans. I don't know. That was really hard. That was when did you start this podcast? 2019. Okay. Right before. Say, I was gonna say because I. <laughs> Yours is 2020, right? <laughs> yeah. Sick, though. The, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the you know the joke that I say is just like the most uncreative thing for a fucking 40 year old white guy to do in a band to be like, podcast. fucking be like, fucking, Oh, I'll still start a podcast, you know, <laughs> fucking the least creative idea in the entire I world. I love it though. You love it. You love doing a podcast. I do love it. And you My know, podcast. Like, I love that. like literally everybody else, like the, the motivation was, I miss the conversations that's that, I'm all, ha- that I'm having that I'd be having backstage. Right now, my phones are off. We're talking. I fucking yeah. love this shit, dude. Yeah. I like, could talk to hours with you. This is like one of my favorite conversations so far with you. Oh, I knew it was going to be sure. awesome. Just like, I don't know, just knowing your history and story and then looking into you and it's awesome. This is, yeah. Like, I this appreciate is, that. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, and you just, I just try to find like some sort of a hook. So like with the first ever podcast, it was like, okay, we can focus on, you know, because it, 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 it opens up opportunities for me to then talk to friends that I have known for 15 years and find new things to talk to them about. 100%. Right. Where it's just like, 100%. I, I actually don't know what your first concert was. I actually yeah. don't know what the first song you learned how to play on guitar was. Yep. What was the first, you know, whatever. What um, was the first song you played on guitar? 
uh, for me, what would it have been? It probably would have been um, Smells Like Teen Spirit. Nice. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was probably something like that. A very poorly, poorly, poorly performed. I never seen I never seen Nirvana. Have you? No. I usually I haven't seen Bo either, though. When I have someone on in your age bracket, because you're a few years older than me, <laughs> one of the first things I ask is, did you get to see Nirvana? Saw Scream with Dave Grohl. So That's close. I, several times. Did you see Scream with Dave Grohl? Yeah, yeah I saw so Scream sick. with Dave Grohl. They were opening for Agent Orange. Ooh, I, asked, yeah. I asked Scott Vogel if he saw Nirvana, and he was mad at me. No, 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 no. Sorry. I asked Dave Grohl. I, I mean, I mean, I asked Scott Vogel if he saw a minor threat, and he got mad at me. <laughs> He's like, how fucking old do you think I, I am? I fucking wish. I saw Embrace. I saw Right to Spring. I saw Embrace. I saw Beef Eater. up for Embrace. I, 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 never I walked said. it back where I was like, Scott, I know so many people that started going to shows and they were like 11. Like, there's a chance you right. could have. I was know, like, yeah, sure. yeah, He's yeah, like, okay, okay, okay. That would have that <laughs> been so sick to see him. Yeah. Right but in a way, I'm kind of glad I didn't. I don't know. I just, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm like, also, by the way, I don't know if you remember, because of the weird thing, I reached out to you and you're the one who gave me Ian's email address. Yes, did he hit you back? To which he did hit me, because, yes. you know, when I wrote that, so for listeners uh, that, right. don't, that don't know this shit, you have to get your fucking tattoos uh, cleared yes, you before do. being on screen because of copyright, the, ha- the, ha- the hangover. The movie The Hangover. Okay. The, Ed Helm, what happened? Ed Helms got the. There's a bit where he gets the Mike Tyson face tattoo. Oh, oh that's, that's right. right. That yeah. tattoo artist came in hot that's and was right. like, "That's my art." Blah blah blah. Even though, if you talk to any normal fucking tattoo artist, they're going to be like, "That's your art. That's yeah. on your body." Yeah. Or right. whatever. I mean, yeah. even if you designed it, sure. But like, you know. So you hit me and hit you back. So. I was like, "How? What kind of a fucking title on this email do I do? I need to lay in here so that yeah. he doesn't delete okay. or skip past it." Before he get to that, what's the tattoo? It's it's a minor threat. Okay. But before yeah. he gets to that, yeah. now now I can talk about because Ian's my dude. I text with Ian. It's crazy. Like it's just, it's very surreal to me because he is my hero and he's everything yeah. I want punk rock to be. And he's still that person. And he's like, he knows how much I love. Him. I talk about him all the time on here. I just went and hung out and brought my wife there for three hours a couple months ago. Love him. But I remember the first time writing an email to him, my grammar sucks. All my shit sucks. Trying to type it up how many times I showed it to my wife, like rough drafts, sat on it for 10. Like, I'm going to send this to Ian McKay. He's going to see, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. just writing the email, I get this weird feeling because it's him, right? It's like a. That's exactly it. Fuck, dude. Yeah. I also and he's went, just a person just like you. Get right. it? Go. Yeah. I also, I also <laughs> went to a, uh, went to a, a Q&A thing that he did at Hollywood High School. Did you go to that? No. Years back? No. It was probably 2008 or something like okay. that but uh but you get his vibe where like there was one or two instances where people were talking a little sideways and he didn't stand for it bro he's so straightforward yeah dude. yeah yeah I so respect it so and he's fucking him guy he's he's bro. whatever so a huge fan so um you give me his email and i'm like how the fuck do i approach this similarly <laughs> so i was like i have to make the title of this email something that he doesn't scroll past so I, the title of the email is literally Minor Threat Tattoo in Weird Al Yankovic movie. I'm like, you're not not clicking that. that <laughs> he checks all his emails, by the way. Yeah. He, he was, yeah. yeah. And he hit me back within probably four hours and was really nice and was like, you know, ended it by basically being like, you know, when we were in the band, never in my wildest dreams did I think that something like this would ever connect, you know, kind of a deal. Um, so dope. And there's a cool, f- so we, he was really nice and we went back and forth a couple of times. Um, I invited him out to, uh, when we were playing in Black Hat, he didn't, he wasn't able to make it, but, um, this last summer we played a fest with bad religion that um fucking brian baker was there for yeah and he was in line in front of me in the fucking catering area and i was like do i just do i mention this <laughs> yeah fuck it i'm bored i'll mention it so i was like hey i uh i love junkyard I, I was like i was like well i was like i was like yo funny scenario i was like i had to hit up ian because of this weird owl thing or whatever i kind of i gave him the you know very cliff no version of yeah. it yeah and I just, he got a big smile on his face and he goes, that was you? And he's like, oh. he's like, there was a whole, e- there was a whole text thread about this situation. That's oh, amazing. That's fucking dope. So, so I joked that like I hit prime level of straight edge in that moment where I was like, man, minor threat. We're having a text chat about my shit. Dude, like, that's, that's incredible. incredible. Yeah. That's why you stay straight edge still. Yeah, it's, I have to. <laughs> I have to at this point. Dude, that's fuck. That's a great, so, wow. I remember I sent you his email. You can hit him up and write you back, dude. It's like, what are the greatest? Like, I think we covered a lot of things here, man. We know you're not an optimist. <laughs> not, I'm, I'm a, I'm an outward optimist, but inside I'm. We know not. your favorite movie, movie directors. Yes, that's so cool. We talked to for the listeners. We put Brolin on Facetime, and 
he got to meet Jeremy before we talked about it because he loves the movies that he's in. That was sick. Very cool. Um, yeah. That was you, worth the drive. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> you have top movies. Yeah. Yeah. You have a top. We got top three. <sighs> I'm curious what kind of movies no, you do. For like old man. Oh, so no. all, all Josh's <laughs> movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, Fargo. So yeah. Owen Brother. Movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely. <laughs> If I was just gonna rattle off, I'll, yeah. I'll rattle off a couple. Okay. Let's go. So, Let's get it. Should I do non Cohen ones? Because no, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, sure. Mix like, it up. Yeah, like No Country and Lebowski are undeniably so perfect, right? So good. Love what I'm hearing. Um, but uh, Rosemary's Baby. Ooh. Wow, my wife likes that shit. That's amazing. Uh, amazing. Punch Drunk Love is, is that's one a great of my one. Is Adam Sandler? Uh, yes, great. P.T. That's Anderson. Really that's a great. That. That's a good one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, who's the who's this, uh, who's the, uh, the the actress in that one with him? Uh, M- Emily M- uh, Ra- Stone? Ra- Ra- Roberts. No, no, no. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. That's a I great one, dude. It's just her birthday yesterday, oh, actually. Emily okay. Watson. You knew it was her birthday. How did you know it was her birthday <laughs> <laughs> yesterday? Uh, it was because the l- Criterion posted like a uh, okay. like a okay. uh, like thing. Oh, okay. uh, oh, this guy's uh, a real fan. Yeah. Harold and Maude. Is, Ooh, uh, wow, that's that old one's shoot. Wow, I'm surprised you know that. Yeah, yeah. Classic. I'm gonna do the thing. I'm gonna rewatch that too. Are are either of you guys on Letterboxd? No. no. Oh, we got to get you on Letterboxd. This guy's on some real fucking We got to get shit. you on Letterboxd. It's the best. It's the only social media app that doesn't make me want to uh, fucking unlive myself. <laughs> Off myself. <laughs> um, so, all right, I'll go highest rating. So, it's like it's a social media app where you just keep okay. track of everything you watch. Oh, yeah, I saw you post so much of movies through the year. Okay. Yeah. So, my I'll, I'll rattle off some top five. Uh, some, some, me, five yeah, yeah. some five stars. Right. Some five stars. Five stars. This is in no order. Okay. But, but uh, stuff I gave five stars to. Mm. Uh the Shining, Seven, yes, yes. Godfather, Seven. No Country yeah. for All Men, Zodiac, yeah. Alien, There Zodiac. Will Be Blood. Okay. Well, there Will okay. Be Blood. Hard. Definitely five star. Uh, Twelve Angry Men. Uh, Great. Fucking The Exorcist, Classic. Heat. Yes. Come Heat? And, really? Oh, yeah. Coming okay. to America? I mean, I uh, no, Come and See. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I do like Coming to America, though. It's a great movie. Yes. We're so uh, old, guys. Five, yeah. Uh, for sure. Ghostbusters. Come. Yep. Classic. Great. Days and Confused. Uh, okay, I yeah. like the topic of that. Yeah. It's a great movie. Uh, That's your girls in it too. Uh, Paths of Glory, Bicycle Thieves, Night of Living Dead. Uh, uh, okay. Fucking no, Goodfellas. Goodfellas, yeah, it's on here. Goonies, uh, not go- <laughs> n- not. N- <laughs> you know, I get ET in mine though. Yeah, no, no offense to your boy. <laughs> I was not a Goonies guy. I it's was okay. not a Goonies it's guy. It's a time thing, you know. Like, I'm not a Star. Really I'm young, not a Star Wars person. But either. Goonies, when when, when we we're growing up, I mean, that was like. Massive. That was so sad. It was massive. You totally. had to be around at that time. Yeah, yeah, for sure to understand that. Today, Max told Josh, "He goes, you were so handsome in Goonies." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "What does that look like now?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the jo- good. the Josh Brolin story that he's told a couple times on oh. podcasts of uh, the the Josh Brolin story of fart face on SNL is one of the funniest fucking. Oh, yeah. Because uh, I've heard Bill hate because Bill Hader has told the story, and then I've heard Josh Brolin yeah, tell the story. Hilarious. But it's like uh, this the skit that was gonna it was just made to, it was gonna bomb so bad, <laughs> like it was it was gonna be like they didn't understand why it made the show, like yeah. nobody believed in it, and they had just got like uh, what went on before them had just crushed. It was a weekend update, and the whole place was alive. And then they knew that 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 was the next skit. So they're behind <laughs> they're behind the curtain, and um, it was Bill H- it was <laughs> Bill Hader and and Josh Brolin. And just right before they went on, Josh Brolin apparently turns around, looks at them, and goes, "All right, boys, let's shut these fuckers up." <laughs> What year was that? <laughs> I don't know. It was probably within the last 10. You a big comedy yeah. fan too? Yeah, I'm a big comedy guy. Yeah, yeah. I love comedy. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. You seen new Dave Chappelle? Yes. You seen it? No. Oh. You like Bill Burr? I do like Bill Burr. Bill Burr is great, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn. Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle. Knocked right out of knocked the park out the bo- Always knocked out. Damn, I feel, I know what I genius, feel like? Genius. This is the long podcast, but I feel like I could do a part two with you too. <laughs> Just talk about <laughs> movies and music. Yeah. Are you a hip-hop yeah, fan yeah, yeah. too, hip-hop? I do like... I. I am, I mean, probably similar taste to you. Like my 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 favorite shit is, you know, the the tribe de la soul, Ooh. public enemy. Like that that's where I best, dude. Yeah, Nas, Raekwon. Like that's that's kind of where I. That's awesome, I, man. Where Mostly New York, actually. Yeah. Yeah. You know which one I also really have a big love for that carried over from when I was a kid is Arrested Development. Great. Yeah. Great. That, that yeah, like yeah, I we Ten, Tennessee was like one Tennessee, of my favorite songs. Tennessee, people, yeah, dude. Yeah. 
So, so good. They just performed on the uh, Hip Hop's yeah, 50th. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. Oh, they did. Yeah, they did. Yeah. We, we, wow. we, we, we were both watching from our houses. I was, I was like, getting oh emo God. watching yeah, it. Like, totally emo. And then Farsay <laughs> came out and Fat Lip Breakdance. Yeah. Oh, they did windmills. It was amazing. It was, it was all amazing. native tongues. It was beautiful. Queen it, was an, it was incredible. Damn. Really I love, love that era. Dude. We're so lucky to live in New York during that shit, bro. We're so lucky, man. That's amazing. Absolutely. We worked across the street from each other in Soho. I was at Nana Shoes. He was at Fat Farm. Yeah. Crazy. Before we had bands. And then, I know, and then, man. And Damn, you guys, you guys go hip-hop. back that far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Fuck. You worked at bars that me and my friends would try to get into. <laughs> yeah. my, wife, my wife was a bartender yeah, I, at. I was working with Moon before he was married to her. Yeah, wow. at the yeah. beauty bar in New York, right? Yeah. He yes. was security. That's right. Thanks for protecting my wife. Yeah. Uh, she, I think she can protect herself, but. I know. That's, <laughs> it was pretty gooned out back then. It was extremely gooned out. Shout out to my, <laughs> shout out to my friends. I'm happy you're still alive. I love you all. Yeah. Um, but, dude, this has been fuck, man. He, Sorry, I know. This is going to be awesome. a long one if you, actually, fuck, if you keep man. most of the shit. Yeah, yeah. dude. People, we don't <laughs> fuck, want some fucking Joe Rogan four hour podcast. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right, I went through all the questions. And you listen to New Hardcore, obviously, you're paying attention. You have a record label, you're signing bands. Yeah. You're still going to shows. You're still fucking in the mix. I do my best to stay relevant and stay up to date. Especially. You are, you are I mean, doing that. Yeah. I, I'm curious about the role of you know having this label. Like, how does that work nowadays? I In mean, 2024? Yeah. Like, let's say there's a band. Let's say I have a new band. Yeah. Which well, you uh, might have one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say I get together. I'm like, I got a band. I got some music. You come, you know, you like it. And you're like, so what do you offer the band nowadays? I'm sure there's a lot of like young bands who are like, so what happens with the label? Are they giving us all this money? Is it, how does it work? Like, I think that I'm very lucky to be in a situation where, if, if you're coming to me, you're you're probably not you're you're not expecting much. <laughs> my my deal with most my seven inch man. Yeah, my deal with most bands is like right. Right. I am I will put my name my my fucking full effort of promoting the shit out of this, and I'm gonna press it, and it's gonna be available. That's that's all I can really do like for you. Like the material, like an uh, yeah, album. Yeah, final. yeah, 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 yeah. So you're going to tour and support it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm lucky to where a lot of the bands I've worked with have already pre-recorded whatever I'm putting out. I so see. I have a record that just came out this last Friday. It's an amazing band called Infant Island. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like so abrasive. It's amazing. Um, but that was a situation where I like those guys and I like that band a lot, and they were struggling to find a home for it, and they were a they were like about to just be like do you think we should just fucking release this ourselves just fucking throw it up on Bandcamp?" and i was like hold your horses let me do it mm-hmm. and then i just took so it's it already over. pre-recorded it was already done. Yeah, yeah 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 i have oh, I, I i don't think i've really dealt because i've done a lot of seven inches i didn't want to do lps for bands for a really long time because right. we all know the fucking <laughs> you when you put out a record for somebody you put that you are holding their dreams and their and yeah, their man. message in your hand and you yeah. want to do the best job possible for them right. so i was pretty allergic to fucking doing lps for bands because i was like i have my own band yeah i have my own so i love doing just seven inches for bands for the longest mm-hmm. time and then dealing with recording budgets and all that oh uh, yeah it's just like i was you know I, I just i was happy to just put out seven inches and shit like that um but uh soul glow who i did an ep for um I was instrumental in getting them on Epitaph. And then once they got on Epitaph, it was like, hey, do you care if my label does the vinyl? And Epitaph was like, happy to have fun with it. So oh, nice. I was still able to be a part of the LP, yeah. mm-hmm. but it was like Epitaph, that machine was handling this, the actual release, which is yeah, great. That's great. So anyway. That's any, cool. cool. Yeah, that yeah, is yeah. cool. Yeah, I was really curious how, how yeah, it works yeah, yeah. nowadays. I mean, people recording music, Billy, in their, in their bedroom. Yeah. Stuff that's like true. That. You know what I'm saying? It's a different world, it's a whole man. Different it's like, world. online yeah. and just like, uh-huh. so you make the product and you have to go tour and support it just like we've always done. We never really made, made money from records. Right. You think yeah. about true. It. You might have done your own tour. It's a different world. No, no, world. no, no, no. You're right. Do you know what I'm saying? No, <laughs> no but like, right. go on tour, sell your merch, <laughs> yeah. play your shows. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The, the label gets no money from the merch before the 360 deals and all that stuff. You make your You're own right. merch, you go and you grind you, and you get your, the message out. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But now it's easier with online and. And EPs, YouTube, a man. lot of EPs. So many yeah. of the circumstances with stuff I put out too were like f- people that I just became friends with who all of a sudden just like were like, hey, can I show you what we my band, my new band did? And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, let me hear it. And then I hear it. I'm like, this is so fucking good. I'll yeah. Put the, I'll put this out. And then that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> like the band when you saw in Canada. Exactly. It's mm-hmm. crazy. Like that type of shit. That's yeah. crazy. That yeah. moment you were there, you saw them and just like, then you put them out and just. Yep. So cool, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they ended up doing a lot of really cool stuff after. It was awesome. So new records coming this year? Yes, we're going in the studio with Mr. Ross Robinson again, uh, and uh, we're going in with him in um, April. What oh, label would this, would this be on? 
You're rolling Abel? Can't say. Okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. I'll just say, we're not an epitaph anymore. Okay, it's not victory, so it's somebody else, yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not real. I don't know if that's still Abel anymore. I will happily tell you since we hit, just, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to get mad at me for spoiling some shit. So new record this year, 2024, Ross Robinson, new label. Yep. Yep. Man, hopefully, out exciting, by fall. Exciting. Hopefully. I'm excited to see what Derek does next too. Yeah, me we're gonna too. We're into that some other episode, yeah, but yeah, another episode. We'll be fronting like a hardcore band. It'd be sick. Ooh, okay. Would you bring it back to the hardcore? Psh, I, I, I can't say no. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, thank you guys for being here. Yeah. Your stuff's all online. Your your label, your yep. you, your bands. Yep. Fucking so yeah, man, this has been awesome. Great to sit with you and hear your story and fucking appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks Listeners are really going to appreciate this. We'll do another we Beloved Ghouls album. You know? Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I want to be on this one. <laughs> You're right. Let's do it. A little faint little part in the background. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening, everybody. Peace. I always ask my guests if they have any regrets. I personally don't have any regrets. Even when it comes to my tattoos, I have the silliest tattoos. Even my ET on my leg, it's still a childhood memory for me, and I love it. I've had tattoos on top of tattoos strictly because I wanted more tattoos. I started getting tattoos when I was 18. I'm 52 now and I can't stop. I've had lazy treatment before on something on my arm. It's four tattoos on top of each other. And that experience at that place was pretty fast. It was pretty cold. It was in and out, swiped the credit card. Don't really tell me much. Didn't give me much details or anything was going to happen. So I never went back. So as of most recently, I'm so lucky enough to have had two sessions at Removery Tattoo Removal. My tattoo on my arm that looks like a big black blob is now super light. I've had two sessions. I have a long road ahead of me. None of this stuff happens overnight. You cannot take a tattoo up in one sitting. You have to be patient. And it's painful. They ice you up. It's super fast. To me, it felt like a bunch of rubber bands. But what's more painful than that is looking at something on your body that you think you're stuck with for the rest of your life. That sucks. But now for me, I'm really happy I started this journey. I'm slowly going to get this tattoo removed. I never thought in a million years I have any kind of real estate on my arm. I don't even know what I want, but it's exciting. I'm so honored to announce that One Life, One Chance podcast is now with Removery. I have a code. Use TobyH20 and get $100 off your first session. Call 866-934-4570 or go to Removery.com. One of the most experienced tattoo remover companies in the world. Over 600,000 remover treatments done. 100 locations. U.S., Canada, and Australia. State-of-the-art peak away laser technology. Cryotechnology to reduce any discomfort. This is so exciting for me because all I do in these podcasts is talk about tattoos. From day one, if you've been listening to this podcast, we talk about tattoos, talk about getting removed, talk about getting covered up. So this is such a perfect fit for me. Once again, go to removery.com or call 866-934-4570. Use my code TOBYH20 and get $100 off. These guys are located everywhere. Try it out.